Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is October 11, 2020, and this is an audiobook of Concerning Questions of Leninism by Joseph Stalin from 1926. I have lately been doing a number of uh, pieces by Stalin from around this time, early years of the Soviet Union. This is yet another one, and I'll probably have some more uh, audiobooks of works re referenced in this audiobook coming up soon. And this is an audiobook that was referenced in uh, actually our last video, uh, whose name escapes me off the top of my head. I think it was um, about building socialism in our country, also by Stalin, and he referenced this, and I wanted to follow up with this since it was in my queue of articles. Okay, so enough of that background. The source for this work is Stalin's Works, Volume 8, January to November 1926, published by Foreign Languages Publishing House, Moscow, 1954, HTML transcription by Brian Reed, published to the Marxists Internet Archive in 2008. That's Marxists.org. I can't thank them enough for putting all of these works online. It's a great free resource for reading more about Marxist authors and revolutionaries. All right, so let's get into the audiobook. Part one, the definition of Leninism. The pamphlet, The Foundations of Leninism, contains a definition of Leninism which seems to have received general recognition. It runs as follows, quote, Leninism is Marxism of the era of imperialism and the proletarian revolution. To be more exact, Leninism is the theory and tactics of the proletarian revolution in general, the theory and tactics of the dictatorship of the proletariat in particular, end quote. Is this definition correct? I think it is correct. It is correct, firstly, because it correctly indicates the historical roots of Leninism, characterizing it as Marxism of the era of imperialism, as against certain critics of Lenin who wrongly think that Leninism originated after the imperialist war. It is correct, secondly, because it correctly notes the international character of Leninism, as against social democracy, which considers that Leninism is applicable only to Russian national conditions. It is correct, thirdly, because it correctly notes the organic connection between Leninism and the teachings of Marx, characterizing Leninism as Marxism of the era of imperialism, as against certain critics of Leninism who consider it not a further development of Marxism, but merely the restoration of Marxism and its application to Russian conditions. All that, one would think, needs no special comment. Nevertheless, it appears that there are people in our party who consider it necessary to define Leninism somewhat differently. Zinoviev, for example, thinks that, quote, Leninism is Marxism of the era of imperialist wars and of the world revolution which began directly in a country where the peasantry predominates, unquote. What can be the meaning of the words underlined by Zinoviev? What does introducing the backwardness of Russia its peasant character, into the definition of Leninism mean. It means transforming Leninism from an international proletarian doctrine into a product of specifically Russian conditions. It means playing into the hands of Bauer and Kautsky, who deny that Leninism is suitable for other countries, for countries in which capitalism is more developed. It goes without saying that the peasant question is of very great importance for Russia, that our country is a peasant country. But what significance can this fact have in characterizing the foundations of Leninism? Was Leninism elaborated only on Russian soil, for Russia alone, and not on the soil of imperialism, and for the imperialist countries generally? Do works of Lenin such as imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, the state and revolution, the proletarian revolution and the renegade Kotsky, left-wing communism, an infantile disorder, etc., apply only to Russia and not to all imperialist countries in general? Is not Leninism the generalization of the experience of the revolutionary movement of all countries? Are not the fundamentals of the theory and tactics of Leninism suitable? Are they not obligatory for the proletarian parties of all countries? Was not Lenin right when he said that, quote, Bolshevism can serve as a model of tactics for all? Was Lenin not right when he, sp he spoke about the international significance of Soviet power and of the fundamentals of Bolshevik theory and tactics? 
Are not, for, for example, the following words of Lenin correct? Quote, in Russia, the dictatorship of the proletariat must inevitably differ in certain specific features from that in the advanced countries, owing to the very great backwardness and petty bourgeois character of our country. But the basic forces and the basic forms of social economy are the same in Russia as in any capitalist country, so that these specific features can relate only to what is not most important, unquote. But if all that is true, does it not follow that Zinoviev's definition of Leninism cannot be regarded as correct? How can this nationally restricted definition of Leninism be reconciled with internationalism? Section 2. The Main Thing in Leninism In the pamphlet, The Foundations of Leninism, also by Stalin, it stated, quote, Some think that the fundamental thing in Leninism is the peasant question, that the point of departure in Leninism is the question of the peasantry, of its role, its relative importance. This is absolutely wrong. The fundamental question of Leninism, its point of departure, is not the peasant question, but the question of the dictatorship of the proletariat, of the conditions under which it can be achieved, of the conditions under which it can be consolidated. The peasant question, as the question of the ally of the proletariat in its struggle for power, is a derivative question. Unquote. Is this thesis correct? I think it is correct. This thesis follows entirely from the definition of Leninism. Indeed, if Leninism is the theory and tactics of the proletarian revolution, and the basic content of the proletarian revolution is the dictatorship of the proletariat, then it is clear that the main thing in Leninism is the question of the dictatorship of the proletariat, the elaboration of this question, the substantiation and concretization of this question. Nevertheless, Zinoviev evidently does not agree with this thesis. In his article, In Memory of Lenin, he says, quote, As I have already said, the question of the role of the peasantry is the fundamental question of Bolshevism, of Leninism, unquote. As you can see, Zinoviev's thesis follows entirely from his wrong definition of Leninism. It is therefore as wrong as his definition of Leninism is wrong. Is Lenin's thesis that the dictatorship of the proletariat is the, quote, root content of the proletarian revolution, unquote, correct? It is unquestionably correct. Is the thesis that Leninism is the theory and tactics of the proletarian revolution correct? I think it is correct. But what follows from this? From this it follows that the fundamental question of Leninism, its point of departure, its foundation, is the question of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Is it not true that the question of imperialism, the question of the spasmodic character of the development of imperialism, the question of the victory of socialism in one country, the question of the proletarian state, the question of the Soviet form of this state, the question of the role of the party in the system of the dictatorship of the proletariat, the question of the paths of building socialism, that all these questions were elaborated precisely by Lenin. Is it not true that it is precisely these questions that constitute the basis, the foundation of the idea of the dictatorship of the proletariat? Is it not true that without the elaboration of these fundamental questions, the elaboration of the peasant question from the standpoint of the dictatorship of the proletariat would be inconceivable? It goes without saying that Lenin was an expert on the peasant question. It goes without saying that the peasant question, as the question of the ally of the proletariat, is of the greatest significance for the proletariat and forms a constituent part of the fundamental question of the dictatorship of the proletariat. But is it not clear that if Leninism had not been faced with the fundamental question of the dictatorship of the proletariat, the derivative question of the ally of the proletariat, the question of the peasantry, would not have arisen either? Is it not clear that if Leninism had not been faced with the practical question of the conquest of power by the proletariat, the question of an alliance with the peasantry would not have arisen either? Lenin would not have been the great ideological leader of the proletariat that he unquestionably is. He would have been a simple, quote, peasant philosopher, as foreign literary Philistines often depict him, had he elaborated the peasant question not on the basis of the theory and tactics of the dictatorship of the proletariat, but independently of this basis, or apart from this basis. One or the other, 
either the peasant question is the main thing in Leninism, and in that case, Leninism is not suitable, not obligatory, for capitalistically developed countries, for those which are not peasant countries. Or, the main thing in Leninism is the dictatorship of the proletariat, and in that case, Leninism is the international doctrine of the proletarians of all lands, suitable and obligatory for all countries without exception, including the capitalistically developed countries. Here, one must choose. Section 3. The Question of Permanent Revolution In the pamphlet The Foundations of Leninism, the, quote, theory of permanent revolution is appraised as a theory which underestimates the role of the peasantry. There it is stated, quote, Consequently, Lenin fought the adherence of permanent revolution, not over the question of uninterruptedness, for Lenin himself maintained the point of view of uninterrupted revolution, but because they underestimated the role of the peasantry, which is an enormous reserve of the proletariat. The, unquote. This characterization of the Russian permanentists was considered as generally accepted until recently. Nevertheless, although in general correct, it cannot be regarded as exhaustive. The discussion of 1924, on the one hand, and a careful analysis of the works of Lenin, on the other hand, have shown that the mistake of the Russian permanentists lay not only in their underestimation of the role of the peasantry, but also in their underestimation of the strength of the proletariat and its capacity to lead the peasantry in their disbelief in the idea of the hegemony of the proletariat. That is why, in my pamphlet, The October Revolution and the Tactics of the Russian Communists from December 1924, I broadened this characterization and replaced it by another, more complete one. Here is what is stated in that pamphlet. Quote, Hitherto, only one aspect of the theory of permanent revolution has usually been noted, lack of faith in the permanent potentialities of the peasant movement. Now, in fairness, this must be supplanted by another aspect, lack of faith in the strength and capacity of the proletariat in Russia. This does not mean, of course, that Leninism has been or is opposed to the idea of permanent revolution, without quotation marks, which was proclaimed by Marx in the 40s of the last century. On the contrary, Lenin was the only Marxist who correctly understood and developed the idea of permanent revolution. What distinguishes Lenin from the permanentists on this question is that these permanentists distorted Marx's idea of permanent revolution and transformed it into lifeless, bookish wisdom, whereas Lenin took it in its pure form and made it into one of the foundations of his own theory of revolution. It should be borne in mind that the idea of the growing over of the bourgeois democratic revolution into the socialist revolution, propounded by Lenin as long ago as 1905, is one of the forms of the embodiment of Marx's theory of permanent revolution. Here is what Lenin wrote about this as far back as 1905. Quote, From the democratic revolution we shall at once, and just to the extent of our strength, the strength of the class conscious and organized proletariat, begin to pass to the socialist revolution. We stand for uninterrupted revolution. We shall not stop halfway. Without succumbing to adventurism or going against our scientific conscience, without striving for cheap popularity, we can and do say only one thing. We shall put every effort into assisting the entire peasantry to carry out the democratic revolution in order thereby to make it easier for us, the party of the proletariat, to pass on as quickly as possible to the new and higher task, the socialist revolution, unquote. And here's what Lenin wrote on this subject 16 years later, after the conquest of power by the proletariat, quote, the Kautskys, Hilfordings, Martovs, Chernovs, Hilkowitz, Longwets, McDonald's, Taradis, and other heroes of two-and-a-half Marxism were incapable of understanding the relation between the bourgeois democratic and the proletarian socialist revolutions. The first grows over into the second. The second, in passing, solves the questions of the first. The second consolidates the work of the first. Struggle and struggle alone decides how far the second succeeds in outgrowing the first. Unquote. I draw special attention to the first of the above quotations, taken from Lenin's article entitled The Attitude of Social Democracy Towards the Peasant Movement, published on September 1, 1905. 
I emphasize this for the information of those who still continue to assert that Lenin arrived at the idea of the growing over of the bourgeois Demo democratic revolution into the socialist revolution. That is to say, the idea of permanent revolution after the imperialist war. This quotation leaves no doubt that these people are profoundly mistaken. Section 4, The Proletarian Revolution and the Dictatorship of the Proletariat. What are the characteristic features of the proletarian revolution as distinct from the bourgeois revolution? The distinction between the proletarian revolution and the bourgeois revolution may be reduced to five main points. 1. The bourgeois revolution usually begins where there already exist more or less ready-made forms belonging to the capitalist order forms which have grown and matured within the womb of feudal society prior to the open revolution, whereas the proletarian revolution begins when ready-made forms belonging to the socialist order are either absent or almost absent. 2. The main task of the bourgeois revolution consists in seizing power and making it conform to the already existing bourgeois economy, whereas the main task of the proletarian revolution consists after seizing power in building a new socialist economy. Three, the bourgeois revolution is usually consummated with the seizure of power, whereas in the proletarian revolution, the seizure of power is only the beginning, and that power is used as a lever for transforming the old economy and organizing the new one. Four, the bourgeois revolution limits itself to replacing one group of exploiters in power by another group of exploiters, in view of which it need not smash the old state machine, whereas the proletarian revolution removes all exploiting groups from power and places in power the leader of all the toilers and exploited, the class of proletarians, in view of which it cannot manage without smashing the old state machine and substituting a new one for it. Five. The bourgeois revolution cannot rally the millions of the toiling and exploited masses around the bourgeoisie for any length of time, for the very reason that they are toilers and exploited, whereas the proletarian revolution can and must link them, precisely as toilers and exploited, in a durable alliance with the proletariat if it wishes to carry out its main task of consolidating the power of the proletariat and building a new socialist economy. Here are some of Lenin's main theses on this subject. Quote, One of the fundamental differences between bourgeois revolution and socialist revolution, says Lenin, is that for the bourgeois revolution, which arises out of feudalism, the new economic organizations are gradually created in the womb of the old order, gradually changing all the aspects of feudal society. Bourgeois revolution was confronted by only one task, to sweep away, to cast aside, to destroy all the fetters of the preceding society. By fulfilling this task, every bourgeois revolution fulfills all that is required of it. It accelerates the growth of capitalism. The socialist revolution is in an altogether different position. The more backward the country, which, owing to the zigzags of history, has proved to be the one to start the socialist revolution, the more difficult it is for it to pass from the old capitalist relations to socialist relations. To the tasks of destruction are now added new tasks of unprecedented difficulty, organizational tasks. Had not the popular creative spirit of the Russian Revolution, continues Lenin, which had gone through the great experience of the year 1905, given rise to the Soviets as early as February 1917, they could not under any circumstances have seized power in October, because success depended entirely upon the existence of ready-made organizational forms of a movement embracing millions. These ready-made forms were the Soviets, and that is why in the political sphere there awaited us those brilliant successes, the continuous triumphant march that we experienced, for the new form of political power was ready to hand, and all we had to do was, by passing a few decrees, to transform the power of the Soviets from the embryonic state in which it existed in the first months of the revolution into a legally recognized form, which has been become established in the Russian state, i.e. into the Russian Soviet Republic. But two problems of enormous difficulty still remained, says Lenin the solution of which could not possibly be the triumphant march which our revolution experienced in the first few months. Firstly, 
There were the problems of internal organization, which confront every socialist revolution. The difference between socialist revolution and bourgeois revolution lies precisely in the fact that the latter finds ready-made forms of capitalist relationships, while Soviet power, proletarian power, does not inherit such ready-made relationships if we leave out of account the most developed forms of capitalism, which, strictly speaking, extended to but a small top layer of industry and hardly touched agriculture. The organization of accounting, the control of large enterprises, the transformation of the whole of the state economic mechanism into a single huge machine, into an economic organism that works in such a way that hundreds of millions of people are guided by a single plan. Such was the enormous organizational problem that rested on our shoulders. Under the present conditions of labor, this problem could not possibly be solved by the hurrah methods by which we were able to solve the problems of the Civil War. The second enormous difficulty was the international question. The reason why we were able to cope so easily with Kerensky's gangs, why we so easily established our power and without the slightest difficulty passed the decrees on the socialization of the land and on workers' control, the reason why we achieved all this so easily was only that a fortunate combination of circumstances protected us for a short time from international imperialism. International imperialism, with the entire might of its capital, with its highly organized military technique, which is a real force, a real fortress of international capital, could in no case, under no circumstances, live side by side with the Soviet Republic, both because of its objective position and because of the economic interests of the capitalist class which is embodied in it. It could not do so because of commercial connections, of international financial relations. In this sphere, a conflict is inevitable. Therein lies the greatest difficulty of the Russian Revolution, its greatest historical problem, the necessity of solving the international tasks, the necessity of calling forth an international revolution. End quote by Lenin, back to Stalin. Such is the intrinsic character and the basic meaning of the proletarian revolution. Can such a radical transformation of the old bourgeois order be achieved without a violent revolution, without the dictatorship of the proletariat? Obviously not. To think that such a revolution can be carried out peacefully within the framework of bourgeois democracy, which is adapted to the rule of the bourgeoisie, means that one has either gone out of one's mind and lost normal human understanding, or has grossly and openly repudiated the proletarian revolution. This thesis must be emphasized all the more strongly and categorically for the reason that we are dealing with the proletarian revolution, which for the time being has triumphed only in one country, a country which is surrounded by hostile capitalist countries and the bourgeoisie of which cannot fail to receive the support of international capital. That is why Lenin says that, quote, the emancipation of the oppressed class is impossible, not only without a violent revolution, but also without the destruction of the apparatus of state power which was created by the ruling class. First, let the majority of the population, while private property still exists, i.e., while the rule and yoke of capital still exists, express themselves in favor of the party of the proletariat, and only then can and should the party take power, so say the petty bourgeois Democrats who call themselves socialists, but who are in reality the servitors of the bourgeoisie. We say, let the revolutionary proletariat first overthrow the bourgeoisie, break the yoke of capital, and smash the bourgeois state apparatus. Then the victorious proletariat will be able rapidly to gain the sympathy and support of the majority of the toiling non-proletarian masses by satisfying their needs at the expense of the exploiters. In order to win the majority of the population to its side, Lenin says further, the proletariat must in the first place overthrow the bourgeoisie and seize state power. Secondly, it must introduce Soviet power and smash the old state apparatus to bits, whereby it immediately undermines the rule, prestige, and influence of the bourgeoisie and petty bourgeois compromisers over the non-proletarian toiling masses. 
Thirdly, it must entirely destroy the influence of the bourgeoisie and petty bourgeois compromisers over the majority of the non-proletarian toiling masses by satisfying their economic needs in a revolutionary way at the expense of the exploiters. End quote. Such are the characteristic features of the proletarian revolution. What, in this connection, are the main features of the dictatorship of the proletariat once it is admitted that the dictatorship of the proletariat is the basic content of the proletarian revolution? Here is the most general definition of the dictatorship of the proletariat given by Lenin. Quote, the dictatorship of the proletariat is not the end of the class struggle, but its continuation in new forms. The dictatorship of the proletariat is the class struggle of the proletariat, which has won victory and has seized political power against the bourgeoisie, which, although vanquished, has not been annihilated, has not disappeared, has not ceased its resistance, has increased its resistance. End quote. Arguing against confusing the dictatorship of the proletariat with, quote, popular government, quote, elected by all, with, quote, non-class government, Lenin says, quote, The class which took political power into its hands did so knowing that it took power alone. That is a part of the concept of the dictatorship of the proletariat. This concept has meaning only when this one class knows that it alone is taking political power in its hands and does not deceive itself or others with talk about popular government elected by all, sanctified by the whole people, end quote. This does not mean, however, that the power of one class, the class of the proletarians, which does not and cannot share power with other classes, does not need aid from and an alliance with the laboring and exploited masses of other people for the achievement of its aims. On the contrary, this power, the power of one class, can be firmly established and exercised to the full only by means of a special form of alliance between the class of proletarians and the laboring masses of the petty bourgeois classes, primarily the laboring masses of the peasantry. What is this special form of alliance? What does it consist in? Does not this alliance with the laboring masses of other non-proletarian classes wholly contradict the idea of the dictatorship of one class? This special form of alliance consists in that the guiding force of this alliance is the proletariat. This special form of alliance consists in that the leader of the state, the leader in the system of the dictatorship of the proletariat, is one party, the party of the proletariat, the party of the communists, which does not and cannot share leadership with other parties. As you see, the contradiction is only an apparent, a seeming one. Quote, the dictatorship of the proletariat, says Lenin, is a special form of class alliance between the proletariat, the vanguard of the working people, and the numerous non-proletarian strata of working people, the petty bourgeoisie, the small proprietors, the peasantry, the intelligentsia, etc., or the majority of these. It is an alliance against capital, an alliance aiming at the complete overthrow of capital, at the complete suppression of the resistance of the bourgeoisie and of any attempt on its part at restoration, an alliance aiming at the final establishment and consolidation of socialism. It is a special type of alliance, which is being built up in special circumstances, namely, in the circumstances of fierce civil war. It is an alliance of the firm supporters of socialism with the latter's wavering allies, and sometimes with, quote, neutrals. Then instead of an agreement for struggle, the alliance becomes an agreement for neutrality, an alliance between classes which differ economically, politically, socially, and ideologically. In one of his instructional reports, Kamenev, disputing this conception of the dictatorship of the proletariat, states, quote, the dictatorship is not an alliance of one class with another, unquote. I believe Kamenev here has in view primarily a passage in my pamphlet, The October Revolution and the Tactics of the Russian Communists, where it is stated, quote, the dictatorship of the proletariat is not simply a governmental top stratum skillfully selected by the careful hand of an experienced strategist and judiciously relying on the support of one section or another of the population. The dictatorship of the proletariat is the class alliance between the proletariat and the laboring masses of the peasantry for the purpose of overthrowing capital, 
for achieving the final victory of socialism on the condition that the guiding force of this alliance is the proletariat. I wholly endorse this formulation of the di dictatorship of the proletariat, for I think that it fully and entirely coincides with Lenin's formulation just quoted. I assert that Kamenev's statement that, quote, the dictatorship is not an alliance of one class with another, unquote, in the categorical form in which it is made has nothing in common with Lenin's theory of the dictatorship of the proletariat. I assert that such statements can be made only by people who have failed to understand the meaning of the idea of the bond, the idea of the alliance of the proletariat and peasantry, the idea of the hegemony of the proletariat within this alliance. Such statements can be made only by people who have failed to understand Lenin's thesis, quote, only an agreement with the peasantry can save the socialist revolution in Russia as long as the revolution in other countries has not taken place, unquote. Such statements can be made only by people who have failed to understand Lenin's thesis, quote, the supreme principle of the dictatorship is the maintenance of the alliance of the proletariat and peasantry in order that the proletariat may retain its leading role and state power, unquote. Pointing out one of the most important aims of the dictatorship, the aim of suppressing the exploiters, Lenin says, quote, The scientific concept of dictatorship means nothing more nor less than completely unrestricted power, absolutely unimpeded by laws or regulations, and resting directly on the use of force. Dictatorship means, note this once and for all, unrestricted power based on force and not on law, in time of civil war, any victorious power can only be a dictatorship, unquote. But of course, the dictatorship of the proletariat does not mean only the use of force, although there is no dictatorship without the use of force. Quote, dictatorship, says Lenin, does not mean only the use of force, although it is impossible without the use of force. It also means the organization of labor on a higher level than the previous organization. The dictatorship of the proletariat is not only the use of force against the exploiters, and not even mainly the use of force. The economic foundation of this revolutionary use of force, the guarantee of its effectiveness and success, is the fact that the proletariat represents and creates a higher type of social organization of labor compared with capitalism. This is the essence. This is the source of the strength and the guarantee of the inevitable complete triumph of communism. Its quintessence, i.e. of the dictatorship, is the organization and discipline of the advanced detachment of the working people, of its vanguard, its sole leader, the proletariat, whose object is to build socialism, to abolish the division of society into classes, to make all members of society working people, to remove the basis for any exploitation of man by man. This object cannot be achieved at one stroke. It requires a fairly long period of transition from capitalism to socialism because the reorganization of production is a difficult matter, because radical changes in all spheres of life need time, and because the enormous force of habit of petty bourgeois and bourgeois conduct of economy can be overcome only by a long and stubborn struggle. That is why Marx spoke of an entire period of the dictatorship of the proletariat as the period of transition from capitalism to socialism, unquote. Such are the characteristic features of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Hence, the three main aspects of the dictatorship of the proletariat. One, the utilization of the rule of the proletariat for the suppression of the exploiters, for the defense of the country, for the consolidation of the ties with the proletarians of other lands, and for the development and victory of the revolution in all countries. Two, the utilization of the rule of the proletariat in order to detach the laboring and exploited masses once and for all from the bourgeoisie, to consolidate the alliance of the proletariat with these masses, to draw these masses into the work of socialist construction, and to ensure the state leadership of these masses by the proletariat. Three, the utilization of the rule of the proletariat for the organization of socialism, for the abolition of classes, for the transition to a society without classes, to a socialist society. The proletarian dictatorship is a combination of all three of these aspects, 
No single one of these aspects can be advanced as the sole characteristic feature of the dictatorship of the proletariat. On the other hand, in the circumstances of capitalist encirclement, the absence of even one of these features is sufficient for the dictatorship of the proletariat to cease being a dictatorship. Therefore, not one of these three aspects can be omitted without running the risk of distorting the concept of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Only all three aspects taken together give us the complete and finished concept of the dictatorship of the proletariat. The dictatorship of the proletariat has its periods, its special forms, diverse methods of work. During the period of civil war, it is the forcible aspect of the dictatorship that is most conspicuous. But it by no means follows from this that no constructive work is carried on during the period of civil war. Without constructive work, it is impossible to wage civil war. During the period of socialist construction, on the other hand, it is the peaceful, organizational, and cultural work of the dictatorship, revolutionary law, etc., that are the most conspicuous. But again, it by no means follows from this that the forcible aspect of the dictatorship has ceased to exist or can cease to exist in the period of construction. The organs of suppression, the army, and other organizations are as necessary now at the time of construction as they were during the period of civil war. Without these organs, constructive work by the dictatorship with any degree of security would be impossible. It should not be forgotten that for the time being the revolution has been victorious in only one country. It should not be forgotten that as long as capitalist encirclement exists, the danger of intervention, with all the consequences resulting from this danger, will also exist. Section 5 the party and the working class in the system of the dictatorship of the proletariat. I have dealt above with the dictatorship of the proletariat from the point of view of its historical inevitability, from the point of view of its class content, from the point of view of its state nature, and finally from the point of view of the destructive and creative tasks which it performs throughout the entire historical period that is termed the period of transition from capitalism to socialism. Now we must say something about the dictatorship of the proletariat from the point of view of its structure, from the point of view of its mechanism, from the point of view of the role and significance of the transmission belts, the levers, and the directing force, which in their totality constitute the system of the dictatorship of the proletariat, per Lenin, and with the help of which the daily work of the dictatorship of the proletariat is accomplished. What are these transmission belts or levers in the systems of the dictatorship of the proletariat? What is this directing force? Why are they needed? The levers or transmission belts are those very mass organizations of the proletariat without the aid of which the dictatorship cannot be realized. The directing force is the advanced detachment of the proletariat, its vanguard, which is the main guiding force of the dictatorship of the proletariat. The proletariat needs these transmission belts, these levers, and this directing force, because without them, in its struggle for victory, it would be a weaponless army in face of organized and armed capital. The proletariat needs these organizations because without them, it would suffer inevitable defeat in its fight for the overthrow of the bourgeoisie, in its fight for the consolidation of its rule, in its fight for the building of socialism. The systematic help of these organizations and the directing force of the vanguard are needed because in the absence of these conditions, it is impossible for the dictatorship of the proletariat to be at all durable and firm. What are these organizations? Firstly, there are the workers' trade unions with their central and local ramifications in the shape of a whole series of organizations concerned with production, culture, education, etc., these unite the workers of all trades. They are non-party organizations. The trade unions may be termed the all-embracing organization of the working class, which is in power in our country. They are a school of communism. They promote the best people from their midst for the work of leadership in all branches of administration. They form the link between the advanced and the backward elements in the rank of the working class. They connect the masses of the workers, with the vanguard of the working class. Secondly, there are the Soviets, with their numerous central and local ramifications in the shape of administrative, economic, military, cultural, and other state organizations, 
plus the innumerable mass associations of the working people, which have sprung up of their own accord, and which encompass these organizations and connect them with the population. The Soviets are a mass organization of all the working people of town and country. They are a non-party organization. The Soviets are the direct expression of the dictatorship of the proletariat. It is through the Soviets that all measures for strengthening the dictatorship and for building socialism are carried out. It is through the Soviets that the state leadership of the peasantry by the proletariat is exercised. The Soviets connect the vast masses of the working people with the vanguard of the proletariat. Thirdly, there are the cooperatives of all kinds with all their ramifications. These are a mass organization of the working people, a non-party organization, which unites the working people primarily as consumers and also in the course of time as producers, agricultural cooperatives. The cooperatives acquire special significance after the consolidation of the dictatorship of the proletariat during the period of extensive construction. They facilitate contact between the vanguard of the proletariat and the mass of the peasantry and make it possible to draw the latter into the channel of socialist construction. Fourthly, there is the Youth League. This is a mass organization of young workers and peasants. It is a non-party organization, but is linked with the party. Its task is to help the party to educate the young generation in the spirit of socialism. It provides young reserves for all the other mass organizations of the proletariat in all branches of administration. The Youth League has acquired special significance since the consolidation of the dictatorship of the proletariat in the period of extensive cultural and educational work carried on by the proletariat. Lastly, there is the party of the proletariat, its vanguard. Its strength lies in the fact that it draws into its ranks all the best elements of the proletariat from all the mass organizations of the latter. Its function is to combine the work of all the mass organizations of the proletariat without exception and to direct their activities towards a single goal, the goal of the emancipation of the proletariat. And it is absolutely necessary to combine and direct them towards a single goal for otherwise unity in the struggle of the proletariat is impossible, for otherwise the guidance of the proletarian masses in their struggle for power, in their struggle for building socialism, is impossible. But only the vanguard of the proletariat, its party, is capable of combining and directing the work of the mass organizations of the proletariat. Only the party of the proletariat, only the Communist Party, is capable of fulfilling this role of main leader in the system of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Why? Quoting the foundations of Leninism, because, in the first place, it is the rallying center of the finest elements in the working class, who have direct connections with the non-party organizations of the proletariat, and very frequently lead them, because, secondly, the party, as the rallying center of the finest members of the working class, is the best school for training leaders of the working class, capable of directing every form of organization of their class, because, thirdly, the party, as the best school for training leaders of the working class, is, by reason of its experience and prestige, the only organization capable of centralizing the leadership of the struggle of the proletariat, thus transforming each and every non-party organization of the working class into an auxiliary body and transmission belt linking the party with the class." Unquote. The party is the main guiding force in the system of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Quoting Lenin, the party is the highest form of class organization of the proletariat. To sum up, the trade unions, as the mass organization of the proletariat, linking the party with the class primarily in the sphere of production, the Soviets, as the mass organization of the working people, linking the party with the latter primarily in the sphere of state administration, the cooperatives, as the mass organization mainly of the peasantry, linking the party with the peasant masses primarily in the economic sphere, in the sphere of drawing the peasantry into the work of socialist construction, the Youth League, as the mass organization of young workers and peasants, whose mission it is to help the vanguard of the proletariat in the socialist education of the new generation and in training young reserves, and finally the party, as the main directing force in the system of the dictatorship of the proletariat, whose mission it is to lead all these mass organizations. Such, in general, is the picture of the mechanism of the dictatorship, 
the picture of the system of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Without the party as the main guiding force, it is impossible for the dictatorship of the proletariat to be at all durable and firm. Thus, in the words of Lenin, quote, taken as a whole, we have a formally non-communist, flexible and relatively wide and very powerful proletarian apparatus, by means of which the party is closely linked with the class and with the masses, and by means of which, under the leadership of the party, the dictatorship of the class is exercised, unquote. Of course, this must not be understood in the sense that the party can or should take the place of the trade unions, the Soviets, and the other mass organizations. The party exercises the dictatorship of the proletariat. However, it exercises it not directly, but with the help of the trade unions and through the Soviets and their ramifications. Without these transmission belts, it would be impossible for the dictatorship to be at all firm. Quote, it is impossible to exercise the dictatorship, says Lenin, without having a number of transmission belts from the vanguard to the mass of the advanced class and from the latter to the mass of the working people. Quote, the party, so to speak, draws into its ranks the vanguard of the proletariat, and this vanguard exercises the dictatorship of the proletariat. Without a foundation like the trade unions, the dictatorship cannot be exercised, state functions cannot be fulfilled, and these functions have to be exercised through a number of special institutions of a new type, namely through the Soviet apparatus. Unquote. The highest expression of the leading role of the party here in the Soviet Union, in the land of the dictatorship of the proletariat, for example, is the fact that not a single important political or organizational question is decided by our Soviet and other mass organizations without guiding directives from the party. In this sense, it could be said that the dictatorship of the proletariat is, in essence, the dictatorship of its vanguard, the dictatorship of its party, as the main guiding force of the proletariat. Here is what Lenin said on this subject at the Second Congress of the Comintern. Quote, Tanner says that he stands for the dictatorship of the proletariat, but the dictatorship of the proletariat is not conceived quite in the same way as we conceive it. He says that by the dictatorship of the proletariat, we mean, in essence, the dictatorship of its organized and class-conscious minority. And as a matter of fact, in the era of capitalism, when the masses of the workers are continuously subjected to exploitation and cannot develop their human potentialities, the most characteristic feature of working class political parties is that they can embrace only a minority of their class. A political party can comprise only a minority of the class in the same way as the really class conscious workers in every capitalist society constitute only a minority of all the workers. That is why we must admit that only this class-conscious minority can guide the broad masses of the workers and lead them. And if Comrade Tanner says that he is opposed to parties, but at the same time is in favor of the minority consisting of the best organized and most revolutionary workers showing the way to the whole of the proletariat, then I say that there really is no difference between us." Unquote. But this, however, must not be understood in the sense that a sign of equality can be put between the dictatorship of the proletariat and the leading role of the party, the dictatorship of the party, that the former can be identified with the latter, that the latter can be substituted for the former. Sorin, for example, says that, quote, the dictatorship of the proletariat is the dictatorship of our party. This thesis, as you see, identifies the dictatorship of the party with the dictatorship of the proletariat. Can we regard this identification as correct and yet remain on the ground of Leninism? No, we cannot, and for the following reasons. Firstly, in the passage from his speech at the Second Congress of the Comintern quoted above, Lenin does not by any means identify the leading role of the party with the dictatorship of the proletariat. He merely says that, quote, only this class-conscious minority, i.e. the party, can guide the broad masses of the workers and lead them, unquote, that it is precisely in this sense that, quote, by the dictatorship of the proletariat, we mean, in essence, the dictatorship of its organized and class-conscious minority, unquote. To say, in essence, does not mean wholly. We often say that the national question is, in essence, a peasant question, and this is quite true. 
But this does not mean that the national question is covered by the peasant question, that the peasant question is equal in scope to the national question, that the peasant question and the national question are identical. There is no need to prove that the national question is wider and richer in its scope than the peasant question. The same must be said by analogy as regards the leading role of the party and the dictatorship of the proletariat. Although the party carries out the dictatorship of the proletariat, and in this sense the dictatorship of the proletariat is in essence the dictatorship of its party, this does not mean that the dictatorship of the party, its leading role, is identical with the dictatorship of the proletariat, that the former is equal in scope to the latter. There is no need to prove that the dictatorship of the proletariat is wider and richer in its scope than the leading role of the party. The party carries out the dictatorship of the proletariat, but it carries out the dictatorship of the proletariat and not any other kind of dictatorship. Whoever identifies the leading role of the party with the dictatorship of the proletariat substitutes dictatorship of the party for the dictatorship of the proletariat. Secondly, not a single important decision is arrived at by the mass organizations of the proletariat without guiding directives from the party. That is perfectly true. But does that mean that the dictatorship of the proletariat consists entirely of the guiding directives given by the party? Does that mean that, in view of this, the guiding directives of the party can be identified with the dictatorship of the proletariat? Of course not. The dictatorship of the proletariat consists of the guiding directives of the party, plus the carrying out of these directives by the mass organizations of the proletariat, plus their fulfillment by the population. Here, as you can see, we have to deal with a whole series of transitions and intermediary steps, which are by no means unimportant elements of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Hence, between the guiding directives of the party and their fulfillment lie the will and actions of those who are led, the will and actions of the class, its willingness or unwillingness to support such directives, its ability or inability to carry out these directives, its ability or inability to carry them out in strict accordance with the demands of the situation. It scarcely needs proof that the party, having taken the leadership into its hands, cannot but reckon with the will, the condition, the level of political consciousness of those who are led, cannot leave out of account the will, the condition, and level of political consciousness of its class. Therefore, whoever identifies the leading role of the party with the dictatorship of the proletariat substitutes the directives given by the party for the will and actions of the class. Thirdly, the dictatorship of the proletariat, says Lenin, is the class struggle of the proletariat, which has won victory and has seized political power. How can this class struggle find expression? It may find expression in a series of armed actions by the proletariat against the sorties of the overthrown bourgeoisie or against the intervention of the foreign bourgeoisie. It may find expression in civil war, if the power of the proletariat has not yet been consolidated. It may find expression, after power already has been consolidated, in the extensive organizational and constructive work of the proletariat, with the enlistment of the broad masses in this work. In all these cases, the acting force is the proletariat as a class. It has never happened that the party, the party alone, has undertaken all these actions with only its own forces, without the support of the class. Usually it only directs these actions, and it can direct them only to the extent that it has the support of the class. For the party cannot cover, cannot replace the class. For despite all its important leading role, the party still remains a part of the class. Therefore, whoever identifies the leading role of the party with the dictatorship of the proletariat substitutes the party for the class. Fourth, the party exercises the dictatorship of the proletariat. Quote, the party is the direct governing vanguard of the proletariat. It is the leader, unquote, quoting Lenin. In this sense, the party takes power. The party governs the country. But this must not be understood in the sense that the party exercises the dictatorship of the proletariat separately from the state power, without the state power. That the party governs the country separately from the Soviets, not through the Soviets. This does not mean that the party can be identified with the Soviets with the state power. The party is the core of this power, but it is not and cannot be identified with the state power. Quote, As the ruling party, says Lenin, we could not but merge the Soviet top leadership with the party top leadership. 
In our country, they are merged and will remain so, unquote. This is quite true, but by this, Lenin by no means wants to imply that our Soviet institutions as a whole, for instance, our army, our transport, our economic institutions, etc., are party institutions, that the party can replace the Soviets and their ramifications, that the party can be identified with the state power. Lenin repeatedly said that, quote, the system of Soviets is the dictatorship of the proletariat, and that the Soviet power is the dictatorship of the proletariat, unquote. But he never said that the party is the state power, that the Soviets and the party are one and the same thing. The party, with a membership of several hundred thousand, guides the Soviets and their central and local ramifications, which embrace tens of millions of people, both party and non-party, but it cannot and should not supplant them. That is why Lenin says that, quote, the dictatorship is exercised by the proletariat organized in the Soviets, the proletariat led by the Communist Party of Bolsheviks, that all the work of the party is carried on through the Soviets, which embrace the laboring masses irrespective of occupation, and that the dictatorship has to be exercised through the Soviet apparatus, unquote. Therefore, Whoever identifies the leading role of the party with the dictatorship of the proletariat substitutes the party for the Soviets, i.e. for the state power. Fifthly, the concept of dictatorship of the proletariat is a state concept. The dictatorship of the proletariat necessarily includes the concept of force. There is no dictatorship without the use of force, if dictatorship is to be understood in the strict sense of the word. Lenin defines the dictatorship of the proletariat as, quote, power based directly on the use of force, unquote. Hence, to talk about dictatorship of the party in relation to the proletarian class and to identify it with the dictatorship of the proletariat is tantamount to saying that in relation to its class, the party must not only be a guide, not only a leader and teacher, but also a sort of dictator employing force against it, which, of course, is quite incorrect. Therefore, whoever identifies, quote, dictatorship of the party with the dictatorship of the proletariat, tacitly proceeds from the assumption that the prestige of the party can be built up on force employed against the working class, which is absurd and quite incompatible with Leninism. The prestige of the party is sustained by the confidence of its working class, and the confidence of the working class is gained not by force, force only kills it, but by the party's correct theory, by the party's correct policy, by the party's devotion to the working class, by its connection with the masses of the working people, by its readiness and ability to convince the masses of the correctness of its slogans. What then follows from all this? From this it follows that, one, Lenin uses the word dictatorship of the party not in the strict sense of the word, power based on the use of force, but in the figurative sense, in the sense of its undivided leadership. Two, Whoever identifies the leadership of the party with the dictatorship of the proletariat distorts Lenin, wrongly attributing to the party the function of employing force against the working class as a whole. 3. Whoever attributes to the party the function, which it does not possess, of employing force against the working class as a whole, violates the elementary requirements of correct mutual relations between the vanguard and the class, between the party and the proletariat. Thus, we have come right up to the question of the mutual relations between the party and the class, between party and non-party members of the working class. Lenin defines these mutual relations as mutual confidence between the vanguard of the working class and the mass of the workers. What does this mean? It means, firstly, that the party must closely heed the voice of the masses, that it must pay careful attention to the revolutionary instinct of the masses, that it must study the practice of the struggle of the masses and, on this basis, test the correctness of its own policy. That, consequently, it must not only teach the masses, but also learn from them. It means, secondly, that the party must, day by day, win the confidence of the proletarian masses. That it must, by its policy and work, secure the support of the masses. That it must not command, but primarily convince the masses, helping them to realize through their own experience the correctness of the policy of the party, that consequently it must be the guide, the leader and teacher of its class. To violate these conditions means to upset the correct mutual relations between the vanguard and the class, to undermine mutual confidence, to shatter both class and party discipline. Quote, Certainly, says Lenin, 
Almost everyone now realizes that the Bolsheviks could not have maintained themselves in power for two and a half months, let alone two and a half years, without the strictest, truly iron discipline in our party, and without the fullest and unreserved support of the latter by the whole mass of the working class. That is, by all its thinking, honest, self-sacrificing, and influential elements, capable of leading or of carrying with them the backward strata. The dictatorship of the proletariat, says Lenin further, is a stubborn struggle, bloody and bloodless, violent and peaceful, military and economic, educational and administrative, against the forces and traditions of the old society. The force of habit of millions and tens of millions is a most terrible force. Without an iron party tempered in the struggle, without a party enjoying the confidence of all that is honest in the given class, without a party capable of watching and influencing the mood of the masses, it is impossible to conduct such a struggle successfully. Unquote. But how does the party acquire this confidence and support of the class? How is the iron discipline necessary for the dictatorship of the proletariat built up within the working class? On what soil does it grow up? Here is what Lenin says on this subject. Quote, How is the discipline of the Revolutionary Party of the Proletariat maintained? How is it tested? How is it reinforced? Firstly, by the class consciousness of the proletarian vanguard and by its devotion to the revolution, by its stamina, self-sacrifice, and heroism. Secondly, by its ability to link itself with, to keep in close touch with, and to a certain extent, if you like, to merge with the non-proletarian laboring masses. Thirdly, by the correctness of the political leadership exercised by this vanguard, by the correctness of its political strategy and tactics, provided that the broadest masses have been convinced through their own experience of this correctness. Without these conditions, discipline in a revolutionary party that is really capable of being the party of the advanced class, whose mission it is to overthrow the bourgeoisie and transform the whole of society, cannot be achieved. Without these conditions, attempts to establish discipline inevitably become a cipher, an empty phrase, mere affectation. On the other hand, these conditions cannot arise all at once. They are created only by prolonged effort and hard-won experience. Their creation is facilitated only by correct revolutionary theory, which, in its turn, is not a dogma, but assumes final shape only in close connection with the practical activity of a truly mass and truly revolutionary movement. And further, quote, Victory over capitalism requires the correct correlation between the leading communist party, the revolutionary class, the proletariat, and the masses, i.e. the working people and exploited as a whole. Only the Communist Party, if it really is the vanguard of the revolutionary class, if it contains all the best representatives of that class, if it consists of fully class-conscious and devoted communists who have been educated and steeled by the experience of stubborn revolutionary struggle, if this party has succeeded in linking itself inseparably with the whole life of its class and, through it, with the whole mass of exploited, and if it has succeeded in inspiring the complete confidence of this class and this mass, only such a party is capable of leading the proletariat in the most ruthless, resolute, and final struggle against all the forces of capitalism. On the other hand, only under the leadership of such a party can the proletariat develop the full might of its revolutionary onslaught and nullify the inevitable apathy and partly resistance of the small minority of the labor aristocracy corrupted by capitalism, and of the old trade union and cooperative leaders, etc. Only then will it be able to display its full strength, which, owing to the very economic structure of capitalist society, is immeasurably greater than the proportion of the population it constitutes. Unquote. From these quotations it follows that, one, the prestige of the party and the iron discipline within the working class that are necessary for the dictatorship of the proletariat are built up not on fear or on, quote, unrestricted rights of the party, but on the confidence of the working class in the party, on the support which the party receives from the working class. Two, the confidence of the working class in the party is not acquired at one stroke, and not by means of force against the working class, but by the party's prolonged work among the masses, by the correct policy of the party, by the ability of the party to convince the masses through their own experience of the correctness of its policy, 
by the ability of the party to secure the support of the working class and to take the lead of the masses of the working class. Three, without a correct party policy, reinforced by the experience of the struggle of the masses, and without the confidence of the working class, there is not and cannot be real leadership by the party. Four, the party and its leadership, if the party enjoys the confidence of the class, and if this leadership is real leadership, cannot be counterposed to the dictatorship of the proletariat, because without the leadership of the party, the dictatorship of the party, Enjoying the confidence of the working class, it is impossible for the dictatorship of the proletariat to be at all firm. Without these conditions, the prestige of the party and iron discipline within the working class are either empty phrases or boastfulness and adventurism. It is impossible to counterpose the dictatorship of the proletariat to the leadership, the dictatorship of the party. It is impossible because the leadership of the party is the principal thing in the dictatorship of the proletariat, if we have in mind a dictatorship that is at all firm and complete, and not one like the Paris Commune, for instance, which was neither a complete nor a firm dictatorship. It is impossible because the dictatorship of the proletariat and the leadership of the party lie, as it were, on the same line of activity, operate in the same direction. Quote, the mere presentation of the question, says Lenin, dictatorship of the party or dictatorship of the class, dictatorship party of the leaders, or dictatorship party of the masses, testifies to the most incredible and hopeless confusion of thought. Everyone knows that the masses are divided into classes, that usually, and in the majority of cases, at least in modern civilized countries, classes are led by political parties, that political parties, as a general rule, are directed by more or less stable groups composed of the most authoritative influential and experienced members who are elected to the most responsible positions and are called leaders to go so far as to counterpose in general dictatorship of the masses to dictatorship of the leaders is ridiculously absurd and stupid unquote. that is absolutely correct but that correct statement proceeds from the premise that correct mutual relations exist between the vanguard and the masses of the workers between the party and the class. It proceeds from the assumption that the mutual relations between the vanguard and the class remain, so to say, normal, within the bounds of mutual confidence. But what if the correct mutual relations between the vanguard and the class, the relations of mutual confidence between the party and the class, are upset? What if the party begins, in some way or another, to counterpose itself to the class? thus upsetting the foundations of its correct mutual relations with the class, thus upsetting the foundations of mutual confidence. Are such cases at all possible? Yes, they are. They are possible, one, if the party begins to build its prestige among the masses, not on its work and on the confidence of the masses, but on its, quote, unrestricted rights. Two, if the party's policy is obviously wrong and the party is unwilling to reconsider and rectify its mistake. Three, if the party's policy is correct on the whole, but the masses are not yet ready to make it their own, and the party is either unwilling or unable to bide its time so as to give the masses opportunity to become convinced of their own experience that the party's policy is correct and seeks to impose it on the masses. The history of our party provides a number of such cases. Various groups and factions in our party have come to grief and disappeared, because they violated one of these three conditions, and sometimes all these conditions taken together. But it follows from this that counterposing the dictatorship of the proletariat to the dictatorship or leadership of the party can be regarded as incorrect only, one, if by dictatorship of the party in relation to the working class we mean not a dictatorship in the proper sense of the word, power based on the use of force, but the leadership of the party which precludes the use of force against the working class as a whole, against its majority, precisely as Len Lenin meant it. Two, if the party has the qualifications to be the real leader of the class, i.e., if the party's policy is correct, if this policy accords with the interests of the class, and three, if the class, if the majority of the class, accepts that policy, makes that policy its own, becomes convinced, as a result of the work of the party, that that policy is correct, has confidence in the party, and supports it. 
The violation of these conditions inevitably gives rise to a conflict between the party and the class, to a split between them, to their being counterposed to each other. Can the party's leadership be imposed on the class by force? No, it cannot. At all events, such a leadership cannot at all be durable. If the party wants to remain the party of the proletariat, it must know that it is, primarily and principally, the guide, the leader, the teacher of the working class. We must not forget what Lenin said on the subject in his pamphlet, The State and Revolution. Quote, By educating the workers' party, Marxism educates the vanguard of the proletariat, which is capable of taking power and of leading the whole people to socialism, of directing and organizing the new order, of being the teacher, the guide, the leader, of all the toilers, and exploited, in building up their social life without the bourgeoisie and against the bourgeoisie, unquote. Can one consider the party as the real leader of the class if its policy is wrong, if its policy comes into collision with the interests of the class? Of course not. In such cases, the party, if it wants to remain the leader, must reconsider its policy, must correct its policy, must acknowledge its mistake and correct it. In confirmation of this thesis, one could cite, for example, such a fact from the history of our party as the period of the abolition of the surplus appropriation system, when the masses of workers and peasants were obviously discontented with our policy, and when the party openly and honestly decided to reconsider this policy. Here is what Lenin said at the time at the 10th Party Congress on the question of abolishing the surplus appropriation system and introducing the new economic policy. Quote, we must not try to conceal anything, but must say straightforwardly that the peasantry is not satisfied with the form of relations that have been established with it, that it does not want this form of relations and will not go on living in this way. That is indisputable. It has definitely expressed this will. This is the will of the vast mass of the laboring population. We must reckon with this, and we are sufficiently sober politicians to say straightforwardly, let us reconsider our policy toward the peasantry, unquote. Can one consider that the party should take the initiative and leadership in organizing decisive actions by the masses merely on the ground that its policy is correct on the whole if that policy does not yet meet the confidence and support of the class because, say, of the latter's political backwardness, if the party has not yet succeeded in convincing the class of the correctness of its policy because, say, events have not yet matured? No, one cannot. In such cases, the party, if it wants to be a real leader, must know how to bide its time, must convince the masses that its policy is correct, must help the masses to become convinced through their own experience that this policy is correct. Quoting Lenin, If the revolutionary party has not a majority in the advanced detachments of the revolutionary classes and in the country, an uprising is out of the question. Revolution is impossible without a change in the views of the majority of the working class, and this change is brought about by the political experience of the masses. The proletarian vanguard has been won over ideologically. That is the main thing. Without this, not even the first step towards victory can be made. But it is still a fairly long way away from victory. Victory cannot be won with the vanguard alone. To throw the vanguard alone into the decisive battle, before the whole class, before the broad masses have taken up a position either of direct support of the vanguard or at least of benevolent neutrality towards it, and one in which they cannot possibly support the enemy, would be not merely folly but a crime. And in order that actually the whole class, that actually the broad masses of the working people and those oppressed by capital may take up such a position, Propaganda and agitation alone are not enough. For this, the masses must have their own political experience, unquote. We know that this is precisely how our party acted during the period from Lenin's April theses to the October uprising of 1917. And it was precisely because it acted according to these directives of Lenin's that it was successful in the uprising. Such basically are the conditions for correct mutual relations between the vanguard and the class. What does leadership mean when the policy of the party is correct and the correct relations between the vanguard and the class are not upset? Leadership under these circumstances means the ability to convince the masses of the correctness of the party's policy, the ability to put forward 
and to carry out such slogans as bring the masses to the party's positions and help them to realize through their own experience the correctness of the party's policy. The ability to raise the masses to the party's level of political consciousness and thus secure the support of the masses and their readiness for the decisive struggle. Therefore, the method of persuasion is the principal method of the party's leadership of the working class. Quoting Lenin, If we, in Russia today, after two and a half years of unprecedented victories over the bourgeoisie of Russia and the Entente, were to make recognition of the dictatorship a condition of trade union membership, we should be committing a folly. We should be damaging our influence over the masses. We should be helping the Mensheviks. For the whole task of the communists is to be able to convince the backward elements to be able to work among them and not to fence themselves off from them by artificial and childishly left slogans. This, of course, must not be understood in the sense that the party must convince all the workers down to the last man, and that only after this is it possible to proceed to action, that only after this is it possible to start operations. Not at all. It only means that before entering upon decisive political actions, the party must, by means of prolonged revolutionary work, secure for itself the support of the majority of the masses of workers, or at least the benevolent neutrality of the majority of the class. Otherwise, Lenin's thesis that a necessary condition for victorious revolution is that the party should win over the majority of the working class would be devoid of all meaning. Well, and what is to be done with the minority if it does not wish, if it does not agree voluntarily to submit to the will of the majority? Can the party, must the party, enjoying the confidence of the majority, compel the minority to submit to the will of the majority? Yes, it can and it must. Leadership is ensured by the method of persuading the masses as the principal method by which the party influences the masses. This, however, does not preclude but presupposes the use of coercion if such coercion is based on confidence in the party and support for it on the part of the majority of the working class if it is applied to the minority after the party has convinced the majority. It would be well to recall the controversies around this subject that took place in our party during the discussion on the trade union question. What was the mistake of the opposition, the mistake of the Tsekron at that time? Was it that the opposition then considered it possible to resort to coercion? No, it was not that. The mistake of the opposition at that time was that, being unable to convince the majority of the correctness of its position, having lost the confidence of the majority, it nevertheless began to apply coercion, began to insist on shaking up those who enjoyed the confidence of the majority. Here is what Lenin said at that time, at the 10th Congress of the Party, in his speech on the trade unions, quote, In order to establish mutual relations and mutual confidence between the vanguard of the working class and the masses of the workers, it was necessary, if the Tsekron had made a mistake, to correct this mistake. But when people begin to defend this mistake, it becomes a source of political danger. Had not the utmost possible been done in the way of democracy, in heeding the moods expressed here by Kutuzov, we would have met with political bankruptcy. First we must convince and then coerce. We must at all costs first convince and then coerce. We were not able to convince the broad masses, and we upset the correct relations between the vanguard and the masses. Unquote. Lenin says the same thing in his pamphlet on the trade unions. Quote, we applied coercion correctly and successfully only when we were able to create beforehand a basis of conviction for it. Unquote. And that is quite true, for without those conditions no leadership is possible, for only in that way can we ensure unity of action in the party, if we are speaking of the party, or unity of action of the class if we are speaking of the class as a whole. Without this, there is splitting, confusion, and demoralization in the ranks of the working class. Such in general are the fundamentals of correct leadership of the working class by the party. Any other conception of leadership is syndicalism, anarchism, bureaucracy, anything you please, but not Bolshevism, not Leninism. The dictatorship of the proletariat cannot be counterposed to the leadership, dictatorship of the party, if correct mutual relations exist between the party and the working class, between the vanguard and the masses of the workers. 
but from this, it follows that it is all the more impermissible to identify the party with the perking, working class, the leadership, dictatorship of the party with the dictatorship of the working class. On the ground that the dictatorship of the party cannot be counterposed to, to the dictatorship of the proletariat, Soren arrived at the wrong conclusion that, quote, the dictatorship of the proletariat is the dictatorship of our party. But Lenin not only speaks of the impermissibility of such counterposition, he also speaks of the impermissibility of counterposing, quote, the dictatorship of the masses to the dictatorship of the leaders. Would you, on this ground, have us identify the dictatorship of leaders with the dictatorship of the proletariat? If we took that line, we would have to say that, quote, the dictatorship of the proletariat is the dictatorship of our leaders, unquote. But it is precisely to this absurdity that we are led, properly speaking, by the policy of identifying the, quote, dictatorship of the party with the dictatorship of the proletariat. Where does Zinoviev stand on this subject? In essence, Zinoviev shares Soren's point of view of identifying the dictatorship of the party with the dictatorship of the proletariat, with the difference, however, that Soren expresses himself more openly and clearly, whereas Zinoviev wriggles. One need only take, for instance, the following passage in Zinoviev's book, Leninism, to be convinced of this. Quote, What, says Zinoviev, is the system existing in the USSR from the standpoint of its class content? It is the dictatorship of the proletariat. What is the direct mainspring of power in the USSR? Who exercises the power of the working class? The Communist Party. In this sense, we have the dictatorship of the party. What is the juridical form of power in the USSR? What is the new type of state system that was created by the October Revolution? The Soviet system. The one does not in the least contradict the other. Unquote. That the one does not contradict the other is, of course, correct if, by the dictatorship of the party in relation to the working class as a whole, we mean the leadership of the party. But how is it possible on this ground to place a sign of equality between the dictatorship of the proletariat and the dictatorship of the party, between the Soviet system and the, quote, dictatorship of the party? Lenin identified the system of Soviets with the dictatorship of the proletariat, and he was right. For the Soviets, our Soviets, are organizations which rally the laboring masses around the proletariat under the rally of the party. But when, where, and in which of his writings did Lenin place a sign of equality between the dictatorship of the party and the dictatorship of the proletariat, between the, quote, dictatorship of the party and the system of Soviets, as Zinoviev does now? Neither the leadership, or quote, dictatorship of the party, nor the leadership of the leaders, contradicts the dictatorship of the proletariat. Would you, on this ground, have us proclaim that our country is the country of the dictatorship of the proletariat, that is to say, the country of the dictatorship of the party, that is to say, the country of the dictatorship of the leaders, and yet the, quote, principle of identifying the dictatorship of the party with the dictatorship of the proletariat, which Zinoviev enunciates surreptitiously and uncourageously, leads precisely to this absurdity. Quick comment. Um, every time that they say uh, dictatorship of the party, that Stalin says dictatorship of the party, he puts dictatorship in quotes to show that what the party does is it's not the dictatorship of the party. He's sort of uh, questioning the concept. When dictatorship of the proletariat is written, it is not written in quotes because that is a term he's trying to, you know, legitimize or hold as legitimate. Okay. In Lenin's numerous works, I have been able to note only five cases in which he touches, in passing, on the question of the dictatorship of the party. The first case is in his controversy with the socialist revolutionaries and the Mensheviks, where he says, quote, When we are reproached with the dictatorship of one party, and when, as you have heard, a proposal is made to establish a united socialist front, we reply, yes, the dictatorship of one party, we stand by it, and cannot depart from it, for it is that party which, in the course of decades, has won the position of vanguard of the whole factory and industrial proletariat, unquote. The second case is in his Letter to the Workers and Peasants in Connection with the Victory over Kolchak, in which he says, quote, 
Some people, especially the Mensheviks and the socialist revolutionaries, all of them, even the lefts among them, are trying to scare the peasants with the bogeyman of the dictatorship of one party, the party of Bolsheviks, communists. The peasants have learned from the instance of Kolchak not to be afraid of this bogeyman. Either the dictatorship, i.e. iron rule, of the landlords and capitalists, or the dictatorship of the working class, unquote. The third case is Lenin's speech at the Second Congress of the Comintern in his controversy with Tanner. I have quoted it above. The fourth case is a few lines in the pamphlet, Left-Wing Communism, an Infantile Disorder. The passages in question have already been quoted above. And the fifth case is in his draft outline of the Dictatorship of the Proletariat, published in the Lenin Miscellany, Volume 3, where there is a subheading, Dictatorship of One Party. It should be noted that in two out of the five cases, the last and the second, Lenin puts the words dictatorship of one party in quotation marks, thus clearly emphasizing the inexact figurative sense of this formula. It should also be noted that in every one of these cases, by the quote dictatorship of the party, Lenin meant dictatorship, iron rule, over the quote landlords and capitalists, and not over the working class, contrary to the slanderous fabrications of Kotsky and co. It is characteristic that in none of his works, major or secondary, in which Lenin discusses or merely alludes to the dictatorship of the proletariat and the role of the party in the system of the dictatorship of the proletariat, is there any hint whatever that, quote, the dictatorship of the proletariat is the dictatorship of our party. On the contrary, every page, every line of these works cries out against such a formula. See the state and revolution, the proletarian revolution and the renegade Kotsky, left-wing communism and infantile disorder, etc. Even more characteristic is the fact that in the theses of the Second Congress of the Comintern on the role of a political party, which were drawn up under the direct guidance of Lenin and to which Lenin repeatedly referred in his speeches, as a model of the correct formulation of the role and tasks of the party, we find not one word, literally not one word, about dictatorship of the party. What does all this indicate? It indicates that a. Lenin did not regard the formula dictatorship of the party as irreproachable and exact, for which reason it is very rarely used in Lenin's works and is sometimes put in quotation marks. b. On the few occasions that Lenin was obliged, in controversy with opponents, to speak of the dictatorship of the party, he usually fer referred to the dictatorship of one party, i.e. to the fact that our po party holds power alone, that it does not share power with other parties. Moreover, he always made it clear that the dictatorship of the party in relation to the working class meant the leadership of the party its leading role. C. In all those cases in which Lenin thought it necessary to give a scientific definition of the role of the party in the system of the dictatorship of the proletariat, he spoke exclusively of the leading role of the party in relation to the working class, and there are thousands of such cases. D. That is why it never, quote, occurred to Lenin to include the formula, quote, dictatorship of the party, in the fundamental resolution on the role of the party, I have in mind the resolution adopted at the Second Congress of the Comintern. E. The comrades who identify or try to identify the, quote, dictatorship of the party, and therefore the, quote, dictatorship of the leaders, with the dictatorship of the proletariat, are wrong from the point of view of Leninism, and are politically short-sighted, for they thereby violate the conditions for correct mutual relations between the vanguard and the class. This is apart from the fact that the formula, quote, dictatorship of the party, when taken without the above-mentioned reservations, can give rise to quite a number of dangers and political setbacks in our practical work. This formula, taken without reservations, says, as it were, a, to the non-party masses, don't dare to contradict, don't dare to argue, for the party can do everything, for we have the dictatorship of the party. B. To the party cadres, act more boldly, tighten the screw, there is no need to heed what the non-party masses say, we have the dictatorship of the party. C. To the top leadership of the party, you may indulge in the luxury of a certain amount of complacency, you may even become conceited, for we have the dictatorship of the party, and consequently the dictatorship of the leaders. Quick comment here. 
anti-Stalinism became a huge thing, especially after World War II, because, uh, you know, supposedly Stalin was all about, you know, this uh, dictatorship. I find it interesting this entire that Stalin himself wrote this entire essay um, about this very subject of uh, what the Communist Party was not to be. And, um, you know, it just goes to show if, if more people were to read the actual writings of uh, Marxists, they wouldn't be able to be so easily fooled, I think, by Western propaganda. Okay, back to the text. It is opportune to call attention to these dangers precisely at the present moment, in a period when the political activity of the masses is rising, when the readiness of the party to heed the voice of the masses is of particular value to us, when attention to the requirements of the masses is a fundamental precept of our party, when it is incumbent upon the party to display particular caution and particular flexibility in its policy, when the danger of becoming conceited is one of the most serious dangers confronting the party in its task of correctly leading the masses. One cannot but recall Lenin's golden words at the 11th Congress of our party, quote, Among the mass of the people, we, the communists, are after all but a drop in the ocean, and we can administer only when we properly express what the people are conscious of. Unless we do this, the Communist Party will not lead the proletariat. The proletariat will not lead the masses, and the whole machine will collapse, unquote. Quote, properly express what the people are conscious of, unquote. This is precisely the necessary condition that ensures for the party the honorable role of the principal guiding force in the system of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Section 6. The Question of the Victory of Socialism in One Country The pamphlet, The Foundations of Leninism, May 1924, first edition, contains two formulations on the question of the victory of socialism in one country. The first of these says, quote, Formerly, the victory of the revolution in one country was considered impossible on the assumption that it would require the combined action of the proletarians of all or at least of a majority of the advanced countries, to achieve victory over the bourgeoisie. Now this point of view no longer fits in with the facts. Now we must proceed from the possibility of such a victory, for the uneven and spasmodic character of the development of the various capitalist countries under the conditions of imperialism, the development within imperialism of catastrophic contradictions leading to inevitable wars, the growth of the revolutionary movement in all countries of the world, all this leads not only to the possibility, but also to the necessity of the victory of the proletariat in individual countries. See the foundations of Leninism. This thesis is quite correct and needs no comment. It is directed against the theory of the Social Democrats, who regard the seizure of power by the proletariat in one country without the simultaneous victory of the revolution in other countries as utopian. But the pamphlet, The Foundations of Leninism, contains a second formulation, which says, quote, But the overthrow of the power of the bourgeoisie and establishment of the power of the proletariat in one country does not yet mean that the complete victory of socialism has been ensured. The principal task of socialism, the organization of socialist production, has still to be fulfilled. Can this task be fulfilled? Can the final victory of socialism be achieved in one country without the joint efforts of the proletarians in several advanced countries? No, it cannot. To overthrow the bourgeoisie, the efforts of one country are sufficient. This is proved by the history of our revolution. For the final victory of socialism, for the organization of socialist production, the efforts of one country, particularly of a peasant country like Russia, are insufficient. For that, the efforts of the proletarians of several advanced countries are required. See the Foundation of Leninism, first edition, unquote. This second formulation was directed against the assertions of the critics of Leninism, against the Trotskyists, who declared that the dictatorship of the proletariat in one country, in the absence of victory in other countries, could not, quote, hold out in the face of a conservative Europe, unquote. To that extent, but only to that extent, this formulation was then, May 1924, adequate, and undoubtedly it was of some service. Subsequently, however, when the criticism of Leninism in this sphere had already been overcome in the party, 
When a new question had come to the fore, the question of the possibility of building a complete socialist society by the efforts of our country without help from abroad, the second formulation becomes obviously inadequate and therefore incorrect. What is the defect in this formulation? Its defect is that it joins two different questions into one. It joins the question of the possibility of building socialism by the efforts of one country, which must be answered in the affirmative, with the question whether a country in which the dictatorship of the proletariat exists can consider itself fully guaranteed against intervention, and consequently against the restoration of the old order without a victorious revolution in a number of other countries, which must be answered in the negative. Comment, obviously, what happened with the Soviet Union in the early 90s proves this. This is apart from the fact that this formulation may give occasion for thinking that the organization of a socialist society by the efforts of one country is impossible, which of course is incorrect. On this ground, I modified and corrected this formulation in my pamphlet, The October Revolution and the Tactics of the Russian Communists, December 1924. I divided the question into two, into the question of a full guarantee against the restoration of the bourgeois order, and the question of the possibility of building a complete socialist society in one country. This was effected in the first place by treating, quote, the complete victory of socialism as, quote, a full guarantee against the restoration of the old order, which is possible only through, quote, the joint efforts of the proletarians of several countries. And secondly, by proclaiming, on the basis of Lenin's pamphlet on cooperation, the indisputable truth that we have all that is necessary for building a complete socialist society. See the October Revolution and the Tactics of the Russian Communists. It was this new formulation of the question that formed the basis for the well-known resolution of the 14th Party Conference, the tasks of the Comintern and the RCPB, which examines the question of the victory of socialism in one country in connection with the stabilization of capitalism, April 1925, and considers that the building of socialism by the efforts of our country is possible and necessary. This new formulation also served as the basis for my pamphlet, The Results of the Work of the 14th Conference, Conference of the RCPB, published in May 1925, immediately after the 14th Party Conference. With regard to the presentation of the question of the victory of socialism in one country, this pamphlet states, quote, Our country exhibits two groups of contradictions. One group consists of the internal contradictions that exist between the proletariat and the peasantry. This refers to the building of socialism in one country. The other group consists of the external contradictions that exist between our country as the land of socialism and all the other countries as lands of capitalism. This refers to the final victory of socialism. Anyone who confuses the first group of contradictions, which can be overcome entirely by the efforts of one country, with the second group of contradictions, the solution of which requires the efforts of the proletarians of several countries, commits a gross error against Leninism. He is either a muddlehead or an incorrigible opportunist. See the results of the work of the 14th Conference of the RCPB. On the question of the victory of socialism in our country, the pamphlet states, quote, We can build socialism, and we will build it together with the peasantry, under the leadership of the working class, for under the dictatorship of the proletariat, we possess all that is needed to build a complete socialist society, overcoming all internal difficulties, for we can and must overcome them by our own efforts, unquote. On the question of the final victory of socialism, it states, quote, the final victory of socialism is the full guarantee against attempts at intervention, and hence against restoration, for any serious attempt at restoration can take place only with serious support from outside, only with the support of international capital. Therefore, the support of our revolutionaries by the workers of all countries, and still more the victory of the workers in at least several countries, is a necessary condition for fully guaranteeing the vic first victorious country against attempts at intervention and restoration, a necessary condition for the final victory of socialism." Unquote comment from me how nice it will be when we finally get to the point where restoration cannot take place anymore clear one would think 
It is well known that this question was treated in the same spirit in my pamphlet Questions and Answers, June 1925, and in the political report of the Central Committee to the 14th Congress of the CPSUB, December 1925. Such are the facts. These facts, I think, are known to all, all the comrades, including Zinoviev. If now, nearly two years after the ideological struggle in the party, and after the re resolution that was adopted at the 14th Party Congress, April 1925, Zinoviev finds it possible in his reply to the discussion at our 14th Party Congress to dig up the old and quite inadequate formula contained in Stalin's pamphlet, written in April 1929, and to make it the basis for deciding the already decided question of the victory of socialism in one country, then this per peculiar trick of his only goes to show that he has got completely muddled on this question. To drag the party back after it has moved forward, to evade the resolution of the 14th Party Congress after it has been confirmed by a plenum of the Central Committee, means to become hopelessly entangled in contradictions, to have no faith in the cause of building socialism, to abandon the path of Lenin, and to acknowledge one's own defeat. What is meant by the possibility of the victory of socialism in one country? It means the possibility of solving the contradictions between the proletariat and the peasantry by means of the internal forces of our country, the possibility of the proletariat seizing power and using that power to build a complete socialist society in our country with the sympathy and the support of the proletarians of other countries, but without the preliminary victory of the proletarian revolution in other countries. Without such a possibility, building socialism is building without prospects, building without being sure that socialism will be completely built. It is no use engaging in building socialism without being sure that we can build it completely, without being sure that the technical backwardness of our country is not an insuperable obstacle to the building of a complete socialist society. To deny such a possibility means disbelief in the cause of building socialism, departure from Leninism. What is meant by the impossibility of the complete final victory of socialism in one country without the victory of the revolution in other countries? It means the impossibility of having a full guarantee against intervention, and consequently against the restoration of the bourgeois order, without the victory of the revolution in at least a number of countries. To deny this indisputable thesis means departure from internationalism, departure from Leninism. Comment. So we see today, for example, uh, the United States repeatedly trying to attack Venezuela and uh, overthrow the left-wing government in Venezuela. This is what they're talking about. You know, the fact that China went communist uh, probably helped the Soviet Union to exist for longer than it did because it meant one more country that wasn't going to be overtly trying to attack them to restore capitalism. However, had several other countries gone communist, let's say Germany and France had gone communist, um, would the Soviet Union still be around? There would have been you know, fewer uh, capitalist countries there attacking them and more countries helping. So the more countries that there are at one time uh, that are either socialist or that have a proletariat strong enough to restrain the capitalist government the more likely it is that socialist experiments elsewhere in other countries can succeed and exist without intervention and overthrow by international capital. Back to the text. Quote, we are living, says Lenin, not merely in a state, but in a system of states. And the existence of the Soviet Republic side by side with imperialist states for a long time is unthinkable. One or the other must triumph in the end. And before that end comes, a series of frightful collisions between the Soviet Republic and the bourgeois states will be inevitable. That means that if the ruling class, the proletariat, wants to and will hold sway, it must prove this by its military organization also. We have before us, says Lenin in another passage, a certain equilibrium which is in the highest degree unstable, but an unquestionable, an indisputable equilibrium nevertheless. Will it last long? I do not know, and I think it is impossible to know. And therefore, we must exercise very great caution. And the first precept of our policy, the first lesson to be learned from our governmental activities during the past year, the lesson which all the workers and peasants must learn, 
is that we must be on the alert. We must remember that we are surrounded by people, classes, and governments who openly express their intense hatred for us. We must remember that we are at all times but a hair's breadth from every manner of invasion, unquote. Comment. So also a, a major way that the Soviet Union was weakened in the 60s, 70s, and 80s was by the Cold War arms race and the um, constant threat, uh, overt threat, just as Lenin is mentioning here, of uh, nuclear war and other kinds of war by the United States. Uh, the Soviet Union had to divert a lot of their funds into military buildup that meant, you know, um, they were kind of playing by the capitalist rules. Capitalist, imperialist countries, you know, di they don't uh, fund housing for everybody. They don't fund medical care. They put all their budget into the military. Um, Soviet Union was kind of forced to mirror that more than they would have otherwise. I mean, it, the, the entire point was they were trying to defend themselves from uh, foreign intervention. Eventually, that was a big factor in how they got worn down. Okay. Clear, one would think. Where does Zinoviev stand as regards the question of the victory of socialism in one country? Listen, quote, By the final victory of socialism is meant, at least, one, the abolition of classes, and therefore, two, the abolition of the dictatorship of one class, in this case, the dictatorship of the proletariat. In order to get a clearer idea of how the question stands here in the USSR in the year 1925, says Zinoviev further, we must distinguish between two things. One, the assured possibility of engaging in building socialism. Such a possibility, it stands to reason, is quite conceivable within the limits of one country. And two, the final construction and consolidation of socialism, i.e., the achievement of a socialist system of a socialist society, unquote. What can all this signify? It signifies that by the final victory of socialism in one country, Zinoviev understands not a guarantee against in intervention and restoration, but the possibility of completely building socialist society. And by the victim of socialism in one country, Zinoviev understands the kind of building socialism which cannot and should not lead to completely building socialism. Building at haphazard, without prospects. Building socialism although completely building a socialist society is impossible, such is Zinoviev's position. To engage in building socialism without the possibility of completely building it, knowing that it cannot be completely built, such are the absurdities in which Zinoviev has involved himself. But this is a mockery of the question, not a solution of it. Here is another extract from Zinoviev's reply to the discussion at the 14th Party Congress. Quote, Take a look, for instance, at what Comrade Yakovlev went so far as to say at the last Kursk Gubernia Party Conference. He asks, is it possible for us, surrounded as we are on all sides by capitalist enemies, to completely build socialism in one country under such conditions? And he answers, on the basis of all that has been said, we have the right to say not only that we are building socialism, but that in spite of the fact that for the time being we are alone, that for the time being we're the only Soviet country, the only Soviet state in the world, we shall completely build socialism. Is this the Leninist method of presenting the question, Zinoviev asks, does this not smack of national narrow-mindedness, Thus, according to Zinoviev, to recognize the possibility of completely building socialism in one country means adopting the point of view of national narrow-mindedness, while to deny such a possibility means adopting the point of view of internationalism. But if that is true, is it at all worth fighting for victory over the capitalist elements in our economy? Does it not follow from this that such a victory is impossible? Capitulation to the capitalist elements in our economy, that is what the inherent logic of Zinoviev's line of argument leads us to. And this absurdity, which has nothing in common with Leninism, is presented to us by Zinoviev as internationalism, as 100% Leninism. I assert that on this most important question of building socialism, Zinoviev is deserting Leninism and slipping to the standpoint of the Menshevik Sukhanov. Let us turn to Lenin. Here is what he said about the victory of socialism in one country even before the October Revolution in August 1915. Quote, 
Uneven economic and political development is an absolute law of capitalism. Hence, the victory of socialism is possible first in several or even in one capitalist country taken separately. The victorious proletariat of that country, having expropriated the capitalists and organized socialist production, would stand up against the rest of the world, the capitalist world, attracting to its cause the oppressed classes of other countries, raising revolts in those countries against the capitalists, and in the event of necessity coming out even with armed force against the exploiting classes in their states, unquote. What is meant by Lenin's phrase, quote, having organized socialist production, unquote, which I have stressed, it means that the proletariat of the victorious country, having seized power, can and must organize socialist production. And what does to organize socialist production mean? It means completely building a socialist society. It scarcely needs proof that this clear and definite statement of Lenin's requires no further comment. Otherwise, Lenin's call for the seizure of power by the proletariat in October 1917 would be incomprehensible. You see that this clear thesis of Lenin's, in comparison with Zinoviev's muddled and anti-Leninist thesis, that we can engage in building socialism, quote, within the limits of one country, although it is impossible to build it completely, is as different from the latter as the heavens from the earth. The statement quoted above was made by Lenin in 1915, before the proletariat had taken power. But perhaps he modified his views after the experience of taking power. After 1917, let us turn to Lenin's pamphlet on cooperation, written in 1923. Quote, As a matter of fact, says Lenin, state power over all large-scale means of production, state power in the hands of the proletariat, the alliance of this proletariat with the many millions of small and very small peasants, the assured leadership of the peasantry by the proletariat, etc., is not this all that is necessary for building a complete socialist society from the cooperatives, from the cooperatives alone, which we formerly looked down upon as huckstering, and which from a certain aspect we have the right to look down upon as such now under NEP. Is this not all that is necessary for building a complete socialist society? This is not yet the building of socialist society, but it is all that is necessary and sufficient for this building, unquote. In other words, we can and must build a complete socialist society, for we have at our disposal all that is necessary and sufficient for this building. I think it would be difficult to express oneself more clearly. Compare this classical thesis of Lenin's with the anti-Leninist rebuke Zinoviev administered to Yakovlev, and you will realize that Yakovlev was only repeating Lenin's words about the possibility of completely building socialism in one country, whereas Zinoviev, by attacking this thesis and castigating Yakovlev, deserted Lenin and adopted the point of view of the Menshevik Sukhanov, the point of view that it is impossible to build socialism completely in our country owing to its technical backwardness. One can only wonder why we took power in October 1917 if we did not count on completely building socialism. We should not have taken power in October 1917. This is the conclusion to which the inherent logic of Zinoviev's line of argument leads us. I assert further that in the highly important question of the victory of socialism, Zinoviev has gone counter to the definite decisions of our party as registered in the well-known resolution of the 14th Party Congress, the tasks of the Comintern, and the RCPB in connection with the enlarged plenum of the ECCI. Let us turn to this resolution. Here is what it says about the victory of socialism in one country. Quote, the existence of two directly opposite social systems gives rise to the constant menace of capitalist blockade, of other forms of economic pressure, of armed intervention, of restoration. Consequently, the only guarantee of the final victory of socialism, i.e. the guarantee against restoration, is a victorious socialist revolution in a number of countries. Leninism teaches that the final victory of socialism, in the sense of a full guarantee against the restoration of bourgeois relationships, is possible only on an international scale, but it does not follow from this that it is impossible to build a complete socialist society in a backward country, country like Russia without the, quote, state aid, Trotsky, of countries more developed technically and economically, unquote. 
As you see, the resolution interprets the final victory of socialism as a guarantee against intervention and restoration, in complete contrast to Zinoviev's interpretation in his book Leninism. As you see, the resolution recognizes the possibility of building a complete socialist society in a backward country like Russia without the state aid of countries more developed technically and economically, in complete contrast to what Zinoviev said when he rebuked Yakovlev in his reply to the discussion at the 14th Party Congress. How else can this be described, if not as a struggle on Zinoviev's part against the resolution of the 14th Party Congress? Of course, party resolutions are sometimes not free from error. Sometimes they contain mistakes. Speaking generally, one may assume that the resolution of the 14th Party Conference also contains certain errors. Perhaps Zinoviev thinks that this resolution is erroneous, but then he should say so clearly and openly, as befits a Bolshevik. For some reason or other, however, Zinoviev does not do so. He preferred to choose another path, that of attacking the resolution of the 14th Party Conference from the rear, while keeping silent about this resolution and reframing, f refraining from any open criticism of the resolution. Zinoviev evidently thinks that this will be the best way of achieving his purpose. And he has but one purpose, namely to, quote, improve the resolution and to amend Lenin, quote, just a little bit. It scarcely needs proof that Zinoviev has made a mistake in his calculations. What is Zinoviev's mistake due to? What is, the what is the root of this mistake? The root of this mistake, in my opinion, lies in Zinoviev's conviction that the technical backwardness of our country is an insuperable obstacle to the building of a complete socialist society, that the proletariat cannot completely build socialism owing to the technical backwardness of our country. Zinoviev and Kamenev once tried to raise this argument at a meeting of the Central Committee of the Party prior to the April Party Conference. But they received a rebuff and were compelled to retreat, and formally they submitted to the opposite point of view, the point of view of the majority of the Central Committee. But although he formally submitted to it, Zinoviev has continued to wage a struggle against it all the time. Here is what the Moscow Committee of our party says about this incident in the Central Committee of the RCPB in its reply to the letter of the Leningrad Gubernia Party Conference. Quote, Recently, in the Political Bureau, Kamenev and Zinoviev advocated the point of view that we cannot cope with the internal difficulties due to our technical and economic backwardness unless an international revolution comes to our rescue. Comment, that's a very important point, and I'm just going to repeat it. Quote, Recently, in the Political Bureau, Kamenev and Zinoviev advocated the point of view that we cannot cope with the internal difficulties due to our technical and economic backwardness unless an international revolution comes to our rescue. Comment. Meaning, in other words, on this question of building socialism in one country, Bo the Bolsheviks had managed to take power in Russia. And there was this question, you know, can we build socialism in this country? For people who believed no, they believed essentially it was only a matter of time before the treading water that they were doing. They, 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 they wouldn't be able to build socialism, but they could kind of just hang on to power as long as they could while not really building socialism until, say, like there was a revolution in France or Germany and they were to like bail them out by sending them technical support and machinery and technology and stuff. So that's the point of view, obviously, that Stalin is arguing against and saying also that this is contrary to Leninist thought. Okay, continuing, quote, We, however, with the majority of the members of the Central Committee, think that we can build socialism, are building it, and will completely build it, notwithstanding our technical backwardness and in spite of it. We think that the work of building will proceed far more slowly, of course, than in the conditions of a world victory. Nevertheless, we are making progress and will continue to do so. We also believe that the view held by Kamenev and Zinoviev expresses disbelief in the internal forces of our working class and of the peasant masses who follow its lead. We believe that it is a departure from the Leninist position, unquote. This document appeared in the press during the first sittings of the 14th Party Congress. Zinoviev, of course, had the opportunity of attacking this document at the Congress. It is characteristic that Zinoviev and Kamenev found no arguments against this grave accusation directed against them by the Moscow Committee of our party. 
Was this accidental? I think not. The accusation apparently hit the mark. Zinoviev and Kamenev replied to this accusation by silence because they had, quote, no card to beat it. The new opposition is offended because Zinoviev is accused of disbelief in the victory of socialist construction in our country. But if after a whole year of discussion on the question of the victory of socialism in one country, after Zinoviev's viewpoint has been rejected by the Political Bureau of the Central Committee, April 1925, after the party has arrived at a definite opinion on this question, recorded in the well-known resolution of the 14th Party Congress, April 1925, if after all this, Zinoviev ventures to oppose the point of view of the party in his book Leninism, September 1925, if he then repeats this opposition at the 14th Party Congress, how can all this, this stubbornness, this persistence in his error, be explained if not by the fact that Zinoviev is infected, hopelessly infected, with disbelief in the victory of socialist construction in our country? It pleases Zinoviev to regard this disbelief of his as internationalism. But since when have we come to regard departure from Leninism on a cardinal question of Leninism as internationalism? Will it not be more correct to say that the, it is not the party, but Zinoviev, who is sinning against internationalism and the international revolution? For what is our country, the country, quote, that is building socialism, if not the base of the world revolution? But can it be a real base of the world revolution if it is incapable of completely building a socialist society? Can it remain the mighty center of attraction for the workers of all countries that it undoubtedly is now, if it is incapable of achieving victory at home over the capitalist elements in our economy, the victory of socialist construction? I think not. But does it not follow from this that disbelief in the victory of socialist construction, the dissemination of such disbelief, will lead to our country being discredited as the base of the world revolution? And if our country is discredited, the world revolutionary movement will be weakened, how did the Social Democrats try to scare the workers away from us by preaching that, quote, the Russians will not get anywhere? What are we beating the Social Democrats with now when we are attracting a whole series of workers delegations to our country and thereby strength strengthening the position of communism all over the world by our successes in building socialism? Is it not obvious, then, that whoever disseminates disbelief in our successes in building socialism thereby indirectly helps the Social Democrats, reduces the sweep of the international revolutionary movement, and inevitably departs from internationalism? Comment, I think you see the same thing going on today in 2020 with people shitting on actually existing socialism right now. This has always been the case. This is why reading theory, this is why reading history is important, because you see that nothing has changed since the time of Marx and Engels. Capitalism still runs on the same logic. Socialism still runs on the same logic. And the principles of the conflict between socialism and its enemies remain the same. This is exactly the same as social democrats. You know, social democrats in the 1920s pull the same shit as the Social Democrats in the 2020s. Anyway, continuing. You see that Zinoviev is in no better position in regard to his internationalism than in regard to his, quote, 100% Leninism on the question of building socialism in one country. That is why the 14th Party Congress rightly defined the views of the new opposition as, quote, disbelief in the cause of socialist construction, as, quote, a distortion of Leninism. Section 7. The Fight for the Victory of Socialist Construction I think that disbelief in the victory of social construction is the principal error of the new opposition. In my opinion, it is the principal error because from it spring all the other errors of the new opposition. The errors of the new opposition on the questions of NEP, state capitalism, the nature of our socialist industry, the role of the cooperatives under the dictatorship of the proletariat, the methods of fighting the kulaks, the role and importance of the middle peasantry, all these errors are to be traced to the principal error of the opposition, to disbelief in the possibility of completely building a socialist society by the efforts of our country. What is disbelief in the victory of socialist construction in our country? It is, first of all, 
lack of confidence that, owing to certain conditions of development in our country, the main mass of the peasantry can be drawn into the work of socialist construction. It is, secondly, lack of confidence that the proletariat of our country, which, which holds the key positions in our national economy, is capable of drawing the main mass of the peasantry into the work of socialist construction. It is from these theses that the oppos opposition tacitly proceeds in its arguments about the paths of our development, no matter whether it does so consciously or unconsciously. Can the main mass of the Soviet peasantry be drawn into the work of socialist construction? In the, in the pamphlet, The Foundations of Leninism, there are two main theses on this subject. One, quote, The peasantry in the Soviet Union must not be confused with the peasantry in the West. A peasantry that has been schooled in three revolutions, that fought against the Tsar and the power of the bourgeoisie side by side with the proletariat, and under the leadership of the proletariat. A peasantry that has received land and peace at the hands of the proletarian revolution, and by reason of this has become the reserve of the proletariat. Such a peasantry cannot but be different from a peasantry which during the bourgeois revolution fought under the leadership of the liberal bourgeoisie which received land at the hands of that bourgeoisie, and in view of this became the reserve of the bourgeoisie. It scarcely needs proof that the Soviet peasantry, which has learnt to appreciate its political friendship and political collaboration with the proletariat, and which owes its freedom to this friendship and collaboration, cannot but represent exceptionally favorable material for economic collaboration with the proletariat. 2. Quote, agriculture in Russia must not be confused with agriculture in the West. There, agriculture is developing along the ordinary lines of capitalism, under conditions of profound differentiation among the peasantry, with large landed estates and private capitalist latifundia at one extreme, and pauperism, destitution, and wage slavery at the other. Owing to this, disintegration and decay are quite natural there. Not so in Russia. Here, agriculture cannot develop along such a path, if for no other reason than that the existence of Soviet power and the nationalization of the principal instruments and means of production preclude such a development. In Russia, the development of agriculture must proceed along a different path, along the path of organizing millions of small and middle peasants in cooperatives, along the path of developing in the countryside a mass cooperative movement supported by the state by means of preferential credits. Lenin rightly pointed out in his articles on cooperation that the development of agriculture in our country must proceed along a new path, along the path of drawing the majority of the peasants into socialist construction through the cooperatives, along the path of gradually introducing into agriculture the principles of collectivism, first in the sphere of marketing and later in the sphere of production of agricultural products. It scarcely needs proof that the vast majority of the peasantry will eagerly take this new path of development, rejecting the path of private capitalist latifundia and wage slavery, the path of destitution and ruin, unquote. Are these theses correct? I think that both theses are correct and incontrovertible for the whole of our construction period under the conditions of NEP. They are merely the expression of Lenin's well-known theses on the bond between the proletariat and the peasantry, on the inclusion of the peasant farms in the system of socialist development of our country, of his theses that the proletariat much, must march towards socialism together with the main mass of the peasantry, that the organization of the vast masses of the peasantry in cooperatives is the high road of socialist construction in the countryside, that with the growth of our socialist industry, quote, for us, the more growth of cooperation is identical with the growth of socialism, unquote. Indeed, along what path can and must the development of peasant economy in our country proceed? Peasant economy is not capitalist economy. Peasant economy, if you take the overwhelming majority of the peasant farms, is small commodity economy. And what is peasant small commodity economy? It is economy standing at the crossroads between capitalism and socialism. It may develop in the direction of capitalism, as it is now doing in capitalist countries, or in the direction of socialism, as it must do here in our country under the dictatorship of the proletariat. 
Whence this instability, this lack of independence of peasant economy? How is it to be explained? It is to be explained by the scattered character of the peasant farms, their lack of organization, their dependence on the towns, on industry, on the credit system, on the character of the state power in the country, and, lastly, by the well-known fact that the countryside follows, and necessarily must follow, the town both in material and in cultural matters. The capitalist path of development of peasant economy means development through profound differentiation among the peasantry, with large latifundia at one extreme and mass impoverishment at the other. Such a path of development is inevitable in capitalist countries because the countryside, peasant economy, is dependent on the towns, on industry, on credit concentrated in the towns, on the character of the state power, and in the towns it is the bourgeoisie, capitalist industry, the capitalist credit system, and the capitalist state power that holds sway. Is this path of development of peasant farms obligatory for our country, where the towns have quite a different aspect, where industry is in the hands of the proletariat, where transport, the credit system, the state power, etc., are concentrated in the hands of the proletariat, where the nationalization of the land is a universal law of the country? Of course not. On the contrary, precisely that because the towns do lead the countryside, while we have in the towns the rule of the proletariat, which holds all the key positions of national economy, precisely for this reason the peasant farms in their development must proceed along a different path, the path of socialist construction. What is this path? It is the path of the mass organization of millions of peasant farms into cooperatives in all spheres of cooperation, the path of uniting the scattered peasant farms around socialist industry, the path of implementing the elements of collectivism among the peasantry, at first in the sphere of marketing agricultural produce and supplying the peasant farms with the products of urban industry, and later in the sphere of agricultural production. And the further we advance, the more this path becomes inevitable under the conditions of the dictatorship of the proletariat, because cooperative marketing, cooperative supplying, and finally cooperative credit and production, agricultural co cooperatives, are the only way to promote the welfare of the countryside, the only way to save the broad masses of the peasantry from poverty and ruin. It is said that our peasantry, by its position, is not socialist and therefore incapable of socialist development. It is true, of course, that the peasantry, by its position, is not socialist. But this is no argument against the development of the peasant farms along the path of socialism once it has been proved that the countryside follows the town, and in the towns it is socialist industry that holds sway. The peasantry, by its position, was not socialist at the time of the October Revolution either, and it did not by any means want to establish socialism in our country. At that time it strove mainly for the abolition of the power of the landlords and for the ending of the war for the establishment of peace. Nevertheless, it followed the lead of the socialist proletariat. Why? because the overthrow of the bourgeoisie and the seizure of power by the socialist proletariat was at that time the only way of getting out of the imperialist war, the only way of establishing peace, because there was no other way at that time, nor could there be any. Because our party was able to hit upon that degree of the combination of the specific interests of the peasantry, the overthrow of the landlords, peace, with and their subordination to the general interests of the country, the dictatorship of the proletariat, which proved acceptable and advantageous to the peasantry. And so the peasantry, in spite of its non-socialist character, at that time followed the lead of the socialist proletariat. The same must be said about socialist construction in our country, about drawing the peasantry into the channel of this construction. The peasantry is non-socialist by its position, but it must, and certainly will, take the path of socialist development, for there is not, and cannot be, any other way of saving the peasantry from poverty and ruin except the bond with the proletariat, except the bond with socialist industry, except the inclusion of peasant economy in the common channel of socialist development by the mass organization of the peasantry and cooperatives. But why precisely by the mass organization of the peasantry and cooperatives? Because in the mass organization in cooperatives, quote, we have found that degree of the combination of private interest, private trading interest, with state supervision and control of this interest, that degree of its subordination to the general interests, 
unquote, that's from Lenin, which is acceptable and advantageous to the peasantry and which ensures the, pro the proletariat the possibility of drawing the main mass of the peasantry into the work of socialist construction. It is precisely because it is advantageous to the peasantry to organize the sale of its products and the purchase of machines for its farms through cooperatives, it is precisely for that reason that it should and will proceed along the path of mass organization in cooperatives. What does the mass organization of peasant farms in cooperatives mean when we have the supremacy of socialist industry? It means that peasant small commodity economy abandons the old capitalist path, which is fraught with mass ruin for the peasantry, and goes over to the new path of development, the path of socialist construction. This is why the fight for the new path of development of peasant economy, the fight to draw the main mass of the peasantry into the work of socialist construction, is the immediate task facing our party. The 14th Congress of the CPSUB, therefore, was right in declaring, quote, the main path of building socialism in the countryside consists in using the growing economic leadership of socialist state industry, of the state credit institutions, and of the other key positions in the hands of the proletariat to draw the main mass of the peasantry into cooperative organization and to ensure for this organization a socialist development while utilizing, overcoming, and ousting its capitalist elements, unquote. See Resolution of the Congress on the Report of the Central Committee. The profound mistake of the new opposition lies in the fact that it does not believe in this new path of development of the peasantry, that it does not see or does not understand the absolute inevitability of this path under the conditions of the dictatorship of the proletariat. And it does not understand this because it does not believe in the victory of socialist construction in our country. It does not believe in the capacity of our proletariat to lead the peasantry along the path to socialism. Hence the failure to understand the dual character of NEP, the exaggeration of the negative aspects of NEP, and the treatment of NEP as being mainly a retreat comment. Uh, NEP has been mentioned several times. That is the new economic plan. It was um, what the Soviet leadership sort of had to do as a like two, forward, two steps forward, one step back. Um, they tried a lot of things following the revolution, some of which the country wasn't ready for yet. So they did the NEP. Just go look up the new economic plan. You will see. Hence the exaggeration of the role of the capitalist elements in our economy and the belittling of the role of the levers of our socialist development, socialist industry, the credit system, the cooperatives, the rule of the proletariat, etc. Hence the failure to understand the socialist nature of our state industry and the doubts concerning the correctness of Lenin's cooperative plan. Hence the inflated accounts of differentiation in the countryside, the panic in the face of the kulak, the belittling of the role of the middle peasant, the attempts to thwart the party's policy of securing a firm alliance with the middle peasant, and, in general, the wobbling from one side to another on the question of the party's policy in the countryside. Hence the failure to understand the tremendous work of the party in drawing the vast masses of the workers and peasants into building up industry and agriculture, revitalizing the cooperatives and the Soviets, administering the country, combating bureaucracy, improving and remodeling our state apparatus, work which marks a new stage of development and without which no socialist construction is conceivable. Hence the hopelessness and consternation in face of the difficulties of our work of construction, the doubts about the possibility of industrializing our country, the pessimistic chatter about degeneration of the party, etc. Over there among the bourgeoisie, all is going on fairly well, but here among the proletarians, things are fairly bad. Unless the revolution in the West takes place pretty soon, our cause is lost. Such is the general tone of the new opposition, which in my opinion is a liquidationist tone, but which for some reason or other, probably in jest, the opposition tries to pass off as, quote, internationalism. NEP is capitalism, says the opposition. NEP is mainly a retreat, says Zinoviev. All this, of course, is untrue. In actual fact, NEP is the party's policy, permitting a struggle between the socialist and the capitalist elements and aimed at the victory of the socialist elements over the capitalist elements. In actual fact, NEP only began as a retreat, but it aimed at regrouping our forces during the retreat and launching an offensive. In actual fact, 
We have been on the offensive for several years now and are attacking successfully, developing our industry, developing Soviet trade, and ousting private capital. But what is the meaning of the thesis that NEP is capitalism, that NEP is mainly a retreat? What does this thesis proceed from? It proceeds from the wrong assumption that what is now taking place in our country is simply the restoration of capitalism, simply a, quote, return to capitalism. This assumption alone can explain the doubts of the opposition regarding the socialist nature of our industry. This assumption alone can explain the panic of the opposition in the face of the kulak. This assumption alone can explain the haste with which the opposition seized upon the inaccurate statistics on differentiation in the peasantry. This assumption alone can explain the opposition's special forgetfulness of the fact that the middle peasant is the central figure in our agriculture. This assumption alone can explain the underestimation of the importance of the middle peasant and the doubts concerning Lenin's cooperative plan. This assumption alone can serve to, quote, substantiate the new opposition's disbelief in the new path of development in the countryside, the path of drawing it into the work of socialist construction. As a matter of fact, what is taking place in our country now is not a one-sided process of restoration of capitalism, but a double process of development of capitalism and development of socialism, a contradictory process of struggle between the socialist and the capitalist elements, a process in which the socialist elements are overcoming the capitalist elements. This is equally incontestable as regards the towns, where state industry is the basis of socialism, and as regards the countryside, here the main foothold for socialist development is mass cooperation linked up with socialist industry. The simple restoration of capitalism is impossible, if only for the reason that the proletariat is in power, the, that large-scale industry is in the hands of the proletariat, and that transport and credit are in the possession of the proletarian state. Differentiation in the countryside cannot assume its former dimensions. The middle peasants still constitute the main mass of the peasantry, and the kulak cannot re regain his former strength, if only for the reason that the land has been nationalized, that it has been withdrawn from circulation, while our trade, credit, tax, and cooperative policy is directed towards restricting the kulaks, exploiting proclivities, toward promoting the welfare of the broad mass of the peasantry, and leveling out the extremes in the countryside. That is quite apart from the fact that the fight against the kulaks is now proceeding not only along the old line of organizing the poor peasants against the kulaks, but also along the new line of strengthening the alliance of the proletariat and the poor peasants with the mass of the middle peasants against the kulaks. The fact that the opposition does not understand the meaning and significance of the fight against the kulaks along this second line once more confirms that the opposition is straying towards the old path of development in the countryside, the path of capitalist development, when the kulaks and the poor peasants constituted the main forces in the countryside, while the middle peasants were, quote, melting away. Cooperation is a variety of state capitalism, says the opposition, citing in this connection Lenin's pamphlet, The Tax in Kind, and consequently it does not believe it possible to utilize the cooperatives as the main foothold for socialist development. Here, too, the opposition commits a gross error. Such an interpretation of cooperation was adequate and satisfactory in 1921, when the tax in kind was written, when we had developed no socialist industry, when Lenin conceived of state capitalism as the possible basic form of conducting our economy, and when he considered cooperation in conjunction with state capitalism. But this interpretation has now become inadequate and has been rendered obsolete by history, for times have changed since then. Our socialist industry has developed. State capitalism never took hold to the degree expected, whereas the cooperatives, which now have over 10 million members, have begun to link up with socialist industry. How else are we to explain the fact that already in 1923, two years after the tax in kind was written, Lenin began to regard cooperation in a different light and considered that, quote, cooperation under our conditions very often entirely coincides with socialism, unquote. How else can this be explained except by the fact that during those two years, socialist industry had grown, 
whereas state capitalism had failed to take hold to the required extent, in view of which Lenin began to consider cooperation, not in conjunction with state capitalism, but in conjunction with socialist industry. The conditions of development of cooperation had changed, and so the approach to the question of cooperation had to be changed also. Here, for instance, is a remarkable passage from Lenin's pamphlet on cooperation, 1923, which shows light on this matter. Quote, Under state capitalism, cooperative enterprises differ from state capitalist enterprises. Firstly, in that they are private enterprises, and secondly, in that they are collective enterprises. Under our present system, cooperative enterprises differ from private capitalist enterprises because they are collective enterprises, but they do not differ from socialist enterprises if the land on which they are situated and the means of production belong to the state, i.e. the working class, unquote. In this short passage, two big questions are solved. Firstly, that, quote, our present system, unquote, is not state capitalism. Secondly, that cooperative enterprises taken in conjunction with, quote, our system, quote, do not differ from socialist enterprises. I think it would be difficult to express oneself more clearly. Here is another passage from the same pamphlet of Lenin's, quote, for us, the mere growth of cooperation, with the slight exception mentioned above, is identical with the growth of socialism, and at the same time we must admit that a radical change has taken place in our whole outlook on socialism." Unquote. Obviously, the pamphlet on cooperation gives a new appraisal of the cooperatives, a thing which the new opposition does not want to admit, and which it is carefully hushing up, in defiance of the facts, in defiance of the obvious truth, in defiance of Leninism. Cooperation taken in conjunction with state capitalism is one thing, and cooperation taken in conjunction with socialist industry is another. From this, however, it must not be concluded that a gulf lies between the tax in kind and on cooperation. That would, of course, be wrong. It is sufficient, for instance, to refer to the following passage in the tax in kind to discern immediately the inseparable connection between the tax in kind and the pamphlet on cooperation as regards appraisal of the cooperatives. Here it is, quote, The transition from concessions to socialism is a transition from one form of large-scale production to another form of large-scale production. The transition from small proprietor cooperatives to socialism is a transition from small production to large-scale production, i.e., it is a more complicated transition, but, if successful, is capable of embracing wider masses of the population, is capable of pulling up the deeper and more tenacious roots of the old pre-socialist and even pre-capitalist relations, which most stubbornly resist all innovations." Unquote. From this quotation, it is evident that even during the time of the tax in kind, when we had as yet no developed socialist industry, Lenin was of the opinion that, if successful, cooperation could be transformed into a powerful weapon in the struggle against pre-socialist, and hence against capitalist, relations. I think it was precisely this idea that subsequently served as the point of departure for his pamphlet on cooperation. But what follows from all this? From all this, it follows that the new opposition approaches the question of cooperation, not in a Marxist way, but metaphysically. It regards cooperation not as a historical phenomenon taken in conjunction, conjunction with other phenomena, in conjunction, say, with state capitalism in 1921, or with socialist industry in 1923, but as something constant and immutable, as a, quote, thing in itself. Hence the mistakes of the opposition on the question of cooperation, hence its disbelief in the development of the countryside toward socialism through cooperation, hence its turning back to the old path, the path of capitalist development in the countryside. Such in general is the position of the new opposition on the practical questions of socialist construction. There is only one conclusion. The line of the opposition, so far as it has a line, its wavering and vacillation, its disbelief in our cause, and its consternation in face of difficulties, lead to capitulation to the capitalist elements of our economy. For, if NEP is mainly a retreat, if the socialist nature of state industry is doubted, 
if the Kulak is almost omnipotent, if little hope can be placed in the cooperatives, if the role of the middle peasant is progressively declining, if the new path of development in the countryside is open to doubt, if the party is almost degenerating, while the revolution in the West is not very near, then what is there left in the arsenal of the opposition? What can it count on in the struggle against the capitalist elements in our economy? You cannot go into battle armed only with the philosophy of the epic. It is clear that the arsenal of the new opposition, if it can be termed an arsenal at all, is an unenviable one. It is not an arsenal for battle. Still less is it one for victory. It is clear that the party would be doomed, quote, in no time, if it entered the fight equipped with such an arsenal. It would simply have to capitulate to the capitalist elements in our economy. That is why the 14th Congress of the party was absolutely right in deciding that, quote, the fight for the victory of socialist construction in the USSR is the main task of the party, unquote. That one of the necessary conditions for the fulfillment of this task is, quote, to combat disbelief in the cause of building socialism in our country and the attempts to represent our enterprises, which are of a, quote, consistently socialist type, Lenin, as state capitalist enterprises, that, quote, such ideological trends which prevent the masses from adopting a conscious attitude toward the building of socialism in general and of a socialist industry in particular can only serve to hinder the growth of the socialist elements in our economy and to facilitate the struggle of private capital against them, that, quote, the Congress therefore considers that widespread educational work must be carried on for the purpose of overcoming these distortions of Leninism, unquote. The historical significance of the 14th Congress of the CPSUB lies in the fact that it was able radically to expose the mistakes of the new opposition, that it rejected their disbelief and whining, that it clearly and precisely indicated the path of the further struggle for socialism, opened before the party the prospect of victory, and thus armed the proletariat with an invincible faith in the victory of socialist construction. January 25th, 1926. End of audiobook. There are a number of footnotes here at the end if you'd like to check these out. I'll put a link in the description. Um, so, yeah, again, this was Joseph Stalin's Concerning Questions of Leninism, dedicated to the Leningrad Organization of the CPSUB, January 25th, 1926. Thanks again to Marxists.org for hosting this work and thousands of others. I recommend you go to that site and just start browsing. There are works that are a thousand pages. There are works that are one page. You can find something that fits your interest. Uh, there's a, uh, there's a, a, an occult art called Bibliomancy, where you just sort of flip through a book and see what pops out at you, and maybe it'll be relevant. Uh, you know, of course, I say this tongue-in-cheek, but flip, flip through it. See what pops out at you. You might find something good. Um, Again, so this has been Socialism for All. Uh, what did you think? Um, leave me a comment. I think, personally, that this work, uh, while it tackles some very important questions, this is, again, you know, the early years of the USSR where they were hammering out, you know, uh, not just, you know, party responses politically, but um, reality. You know, everybody now has heard all these questions of socialism in one country and we know how different things have, you know, turned out. They were, at the time, taking it month by month, week by week, day by day. They, they were figuring this stuff out that we all now know as history. But uh, it was an immense, immense work. And I think that that, you know, when Stalin writes here of the massive work of drawing in the peasantry to the, you know, affairs of the party and the work of socialist construction— it is a massive effort. I mean, when you think of how many hundreds of thousands, millions of people had to be engaged by the party, okay? I mean, right now I'm running a Facebook with 5,000 followers and a YouTube with about 800 subs. Uh, we're talking about a party trying to run all of the industry of a large country, giant geographical region, you know, with millions of people. Uh, that is no small feat. And the fact that they were able to do this at all is amazing, especially not using, you know, 
on a cooperative basis, on a demo, industrially democratic basis, um, that they were able to have this new Soviet system is amazing because, you know, the capitalists, what do they do? They just pay a bunch of goons to use force against against the, the subordinate class, the working class. That's how they make it run. They threaten everybody with starvation and homelessness. That's how they get their system to run. The Soviet Union was trying to do something different. They were trying to do something fundamentally more democratic on an economic level. And they had to figure out all these questions. This was the first time ever, ever, anybody had been building socialism on a national scale. And uh, I think it's needs to be appreciated whatever you think of the Soviet Union. And hopefully you, if you're listening to this channel, uh, su you know, support the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, may it return someday in, in even improved form. But, uh, you know, hopefully you, you look on the whole thing fondly and not from some kind of bizarre like trot or, you know, ultra left position. Um, but uh, whatever you think of it, this was a massive effort. The, the fact that they were able to do it at all is astounding. Um, and there is clearly a lot to be learned here. So uh, I'm going to close my comments there. This has been Socialism for All. You can support us at patreon.com slash socialism for all. I try to put up content every week, uh, at least one or two, sometimes more uh, audiobooks. I do both some current events commentary and also, you know, classic texts by Marx, Lenin, uh, Mao, Engels, Stalin, etc. Uh, currently working on a Marxism-Leninism curriculum. We're uh, working on installment number seven right now. So thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. You can also follow us at facebook.com slash socialism for all or facebook.com slash socialism the number for all. I had to make that page as a backup because Facebook has been heavily throttling the page. All right, I'm going to stop commenting. You all have a great day and I'll catch you in the next video.